Aerial video of KSSB campus. KSSB brings to you the brain, visual system, neuroplasticity, and CVI, presented by Dr. Lotfi Maribet. Um, I'm going to go ahead and introduce Dr. Maribet. <clears throat> he is um, an associate professor of ophthalmology at Harvard Medical School. He's also the director of the Laboratory for Visual Neuroplasticity, <clears throat> excuse me, at Massachusetts Eye and Ear, and it, is it Schopens? Uh, Schopens. Yeah. Um, research Eye Research Institute. He's a staff optometrist for the Rehab Vision Rehabilitation Service at Massachusetts Eye and Ear and Spalding Rehabilitation Hospital. <clears throat> Dr. Maribet is, um, is a clinician scientist, and he's investigating how the brain adapts to visual impairment. He completed his doctorate in neuroscience at University of Montreal, and he has a clinical doctorate in optometry from New England College of Optometry. Dr. Maribet um, worked on his postdoctoral training at Harvard Medical School, Boston University, and the MGH Martino Center for Medi Biomedical Imaging. Um, he also has a master's degree in public health from Harvard. And in 2010, he joined the clinical research faculty of Massachusetts Eye and Ear. And he works currently um, on projects that are supported by the NIH, um, the National Eye Institute, Massachusetts Lions Eye Research Fund, and the Deborah Monroe Noonan Memorial Research Fund. Um, Dr. Maribet currently serves on the education and CVI steering committees for Perkins School for the Blind, and he's a member of the Board of Trustees for the Carroll Center of the Blind and the National Braille Press. So we're so glad to have Dr. Maribet here today. I saw his presentation a few months ago, and I knew I really wanted him to come and talk to us um, in Kansas about the research that they're doing in his lab regarding um, individuals with cortical visual impairment and um, what, what we know about the brain. Um, so we can use that to guide our education efforts. So um, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Maribet. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Pam. Uh, first of all, good morning, everyone. Um, I This is an absolutely great opportunity, and I thank Pam for the kind invitation to come and speak to you today. It's, a, of course, unfortunate I can't be there in, uh, in person. Uh, we're living through very challenging times. Um, I hope uh, this finds you all well and safe and your families are all healthy as well. Um, but I appreciate Pam's effort to, to reach out and keep the dialogue going because I think it's obviously extremely important for the families and individuals we're, we're trying to help. So as Pam mentioned, I, I did a similar lecture uh, a few months ago uh, on this topic. Uh, it's, as you can see from the title, it's quite ambitious. Uh, each one of these terms is actually a course in of itself. So in about an hour and a half, I'm hoping to give you some important highlights or what I consider important highlights that could be relevant for uh, you know thinking about visual impairment, both also of ocular cause, but also in the case of CVI, uh, and information that hopefully can give you a little bit of a framework and, uh, and help you make some, some decisions about moving forward in terms of the education and habilitation of individuals uh, with visual impairment as well. So I'm going to break it down into three sections, the brain, uh, the visual system, and the neuroplasticity and, uh, and CVI. I take a, you know, a couple of minutes in between uh, each one of these sections. If there are some, some burning questions, you know, something you'd like me to go over again or something along those lines, you know, certainly feel free. But I do think we'll have enough time at the end for an open discussion if you have questions specifically, perhaps a particular individual you're working with or general ideas, I'm, I'm certainly going to be uh, available and, and, uh, and free to for, for a more open discussion as well. All right, so I believe you do have the handouts and uh, let's get started with our first topic, which is, and hopefully, brain organization, function, and development. So the first slide I always like to use uh, when, I, when I give this type of lecture is a quote that I once heard from one of my mentors when I was a, an intern, uh, a postdoctoral fellow. And he said, neurology is just like real estate. The three most important things are location, location, and location. And of course, what he was referring to is this idea that there is an intimate relationship between the structure of the brain and the function of the brain. That's to say, for example, if we know where damage is in the brain, 
we should be able to predict what type of functional deficits that individual has. And similarly, if we know what type of functional deficits an individual has, we should be able to have a good idea of where the damage is in the brain. So this relationship between structure and function is extremely important and it's a, it's a tenant of, uh, of neurology in general. And we're constantly kind of thinking about this relationship between the two. Of course, what we know today from you know, many, many years of neuroscience research is that the brain is a highly specialized organ. Even though if you were to look at a brain, it looks pretty much uniform on its surface, there's no indication that one particular part of the brain does a particular thing. It all looks very, very similar. But we know, again, over many, many years of research that the brain is extremely specialized and, and highly organized in terms of what it does. So we know that different parts of the brain do different things. We know that there are areas responsible for motor, you know, for movements, other areas responsible for touch, other areas responsible for smell and other senses. And of course, the back of the brain, which we know is responsible responsible for vision. And this is 99.99% of all of us. The brain has this sort of universal organization that it maintains. And then the question is, how did we learn this? And how is this relevant in terms of our discussion? And in particular, what happens during development if the brain is injured, for example? Does this organization change? And what is its impact in terms of its function as well? So just grossly, when we talk about the brain in terms of its structural organization, the first thing you will notice is the fact that there are two hemispheres, the left and the right. And these we call the, 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 hemis the two hemispheres of the brain. Deep in the brain are subcortical structures. And in particular, in terms of relevant of our conversation, there's the thalamus. And this is where sensory information comes in. And then communicating between the two hemispheres is something called the corpus callosum, which literally means big body. And this is a large net of connections that allows the two hemispheres to talk to one another. And we'll go back through these, these steps in just, a, in just a second here. But these are really sort of the big chunks, if you will, the overall structural organization of the brain. Another thing that's very important to realize is that if I were to take a cross section of the brain, just so slice the brain through like this, this is what you would see. You have the overlying area here, right? This is what's called gray matter or the cortex, right? Deep into the brain, we have subcortical structures, right? Which I'm showing you in blue, like the thalamus, which we'll talk about in just a second. We also have these empty spaces here that are referred to as ventricles. Ventricles are located in the middle of the brain and form a Y shape. This is where fluid sits, and one of the important roles of the ventricles is to absorb shock. So, for example, if there if the brain hits gets a, a hit, this allows the brain to sort of dissipate some of that shock in order to stay as intact as much as possible. But an important thing to think about, and we'll talk you know many times about this, particularly in our conversation about CVI, are these white matter connections. That's to say how the cortex talks to the thalamus and how the cortex talks to itself. So these are the, the wiring deep in, or inside the brain that allows communication, right? So just again, to summarize the cortex where a lot of the processing occurs, the subcortical structures like the thalamus where a lot of sensory information comes in and these white matter connections, which allows the communication between all these areas. So it's important to think about of those three levels and we're gonna spend some time about this organization. So first, as I said, deep down these subcortical structures, really the important structure to think about in our conversation is the thalamus. The thalamus is the sensory gateway to the brain right, to the overall processing of the brain. All senses, interestingly, except uh, smell, and there's, and there's actually an evolutionary reason why, why that may be the case, go through the thalamus. So vision, hearing, touch, uh, taste, proprioception, your ability to, to know where your body is in space, all enter from sensory organs into the thalamus and then move on to the cortex. And so again, this is sort of the gateway of sensory information entering the brain, right? So that's an important thing to think about. In contrast, the cortex, which is the overlying surface of the brain, is generally divided into four areas or four lobes. And we call this the frontal lobe, obviously the front of the brain, the parietal lobe, which is up high in this area here, the temporal lobe, which, which is near the ear, right? 
and the occipital lobe, which are, of course you're all familiar with, which is the back of the brain, which is the visual processing part of the brain. So I'll spend just a couple of seconds here thinking about the various functions of these four lobes. Again, speaking at the level of the cortex. So the frontal lobe, interestingly enough, is the last part of the brain or the cortex to develop. So this is involved with what's referred to as executive functions. So creating associations, planning. There's also, we know, speech areas there. Also for attention, uh, the frontal lobe is extremely important for, for, um, for carrying out what we call these executive functions. And this is actually quite interesting. As I mentioned, this is developmentally the last part of the cortex to develop. And typically it comes at full development around the mid-teens, late teens. And those of you who, who, know, who have a teenager probably this makes sense to you because what do we know about teenagers right typically they don't make good decisions till till much later and that actually is in line with the fact that this is the last part of the brain typically that develops right so the frontal cortex involved with executive decisions the parietal cortex is involved with spatial processing, right? Where you are in space and how you handle where things are in space, right? This also has some language areas for comprehension. It's also very important for mathematics and computations as well. So spatial processing, how to deal with spatial information is really part and parcel of what the parietal cortex does. The temporal cortex has a lot of functions as well. It has, it's involved with hearing, it's involved with memory, it's involved with smell, and it's also involved, as I'm sure you already know, with higher order visual processing, particularly when it comes to identifying an object, right? Your visual repertoire, your ability to recognize objects in space is intimately related to the function and the organization of the temporal cortex. And of course, finally, the last one is the occipital pole, which again, you're all familiar with, which is essentially involved with early visual processing. So information from the thalamus entering the cortex and those early stages of visual processing before it goes on, excuse me, to higher areas. So these are the four cortical areas that we're going to talk about. And maybe the first thing that you should maybe jump out at you or think about is the fact that think of all these functions, right, that uh, the cortex is responsible for and look how much real estate is dedicated just to vision. Right. Think about all these things, executive functions, as I mentioned, decision making, attention, language, hearing, et cetera, et cetera, all you know, laid out in different areas of the brain. But when it comes to vision, there is an enormous amount of real estate dedicated for visual processing. We'll get back to why that's important in the later on. So one question that I get a lot is, uh, does it matter where the injury is? So I, I, I made this idea or, or I've laid out to you that there's sort of three levels that you have to think about. These subcortical structures deep into the brain, like the thalamus, these white matter connections that connects in between, and of course the cortex, which is where a lot of the processing actually occurs. And this is important to think about these three levels because where that injury occurs gives us some prediction about what type of, of issues or what type of deficits a patient may have. So again, just to remind you, the gray matter, which is laid out on top, which is the cortex, as I mentioned before in that earlier slide, the white matter, which is the, these connections between the brain and the, and the deep structures that I mentioned, uh, like the thalamus. The reason why there is a difference in color between the gray matter and the white matter has to do with how brain cells are, are, are constructed. So the soma, which is the body of, of where information comes into a, a brain cell, typically lies in the gray matter. But when it sends information to different parts of the brain, it has this insulation, which is called myelin. And myelin is extremely important for the conduction of information. Typically, the more myelin a cell has, the faster it can send information. Um, multiple sclerosis, which you're probably familiar with, is a disease, a demyelinating disease. It's a disease that, that destroys, unfortunately, this myelin protection, the sheath. And because of it, neurons don't fire properly. And typically what you notice is that people have uh, problems with their hand movements and walking, et cetera, et cetera. So a good example, again, how structure and function come together. And the important thing is that these myelin, uh, these axons that are myelinated are, again, deep into this white matter. And that's what causes that sort of whitish color to it. So it has to do with the fact that, that how the cell is organized or the brain cell is organized in the brain. The important thing, again, as I mentioned, is that there is constant communication 
between the cortex and the thalamus. So information is constantly being cycled. It comes into the thalamus, it's sent to the cortex, and then the cortex is again feeding back to the thalamus constantly. So it's important to think about that, and we'll have more information about that when it comes to vision. But there is a constant exchange of information. So the cortex is constantly looking at what's coming in, the information that it's processing, and it's influencing, again, from an iterative process of what the information that's coming in from the thalamus as well. So there's a constant exchange of information. That's an important principle to think about. So I like to use this analogy. I think it, it's kind of helpful to think about how these three levels work with one another, particularly in the context of brain injury. So I call this the building analogy. Think of your brain as a high rise building, right? The cortex is kind of like all those cubicles and the high floors, right? Where all the specialists are working, right? The white matter is like the elevators that's shuttling information, shuttling people from one floor to another. And the thalamus is like the lobby. This is where information is. People are coming into the building and people are coming out of the building as well. So following this analogy, you can see how damage to different uh, these, three, uh, these three levels can lead to three different scenarios. Typically, if a person has damage to the cortex, right, a stroke, for example, right, and, and if I take out some of these cubicles, if the people next, next door are cross-trained and can do the same sort of processing, typically they can take on that new function and there's some, func there's some functional recovery, right? There's some redundancy, so to speak, and that the neighboring areas can take on the new function that of, the, of the damaged area, right? If there's damage to the white uh, matter, right, the elevator system, maybe information can get to other areas from other routes. Maybe there are other stairwells. Maybe there's some other pathways or other uh, elevators that are working. But in contrast, if there's damage to the lobby or to the thalamus, then no information can come in and no information can come out. And that's obviously much more detrimental. And we know this from a developmental standpoint as well. Babies that have really a lot of damage at the level of the thalamus typically are those individuals who have the most uh, impairments developmentally. So the thalamus is extremely important, as I said, for this, this intake of information and exchange of information with the cortex. So it's an important sort of way to break down why a particular injury, depending where it is in the brain, can have a different impact in terms of function. A couple of comments about brain development that I think are, are very important as well. So the basic structural and functional framework of the brain is in place by the second year of life. Brain development after the age of two mainly involves fine tuning, reorganization, plasticity, and remodeling of established major circuits and networks. So let me, let me explain to you graphically what I mean by this. So busy slide, but I'm gonna walk you through the various parts here. What you see on this axis here is percentage change. So the higher the number, the greater the change that's actually happening. On this axis here is time. So we have gestation from birth to two years, three years, all the way to 20 years. So you have time on, on the lower axis and you have percentage change on the vertical axis, right? And again, the higher the number, the more the change. And these are various outcomes in terms of how the brain is organized. It's structural outcomes. Gray matter is the cortex. White matter connections, as I mentioned, are, the, are those connections in between the cortex and the thalamus. Surface area is an indication of how large the cortex is. Fractional anisotropy is a measurement of myelination. Remember, I mentioned that a couple of slides before. Myelination is indication of how well a, a brain cell can propagate and send information. And cortical thickness is the thickness of the cortex. It's also an important indicator of brain development as well. And what's the important thing to take away from this figure? Again, up to the age of two, there's dramatic, dramatic change, right, in all these outcomes. But after the age of two, the only thing that really changes is connections, right? So essentially, by the age of two, you're born with all the brain machinery, so to speak, that you're going to get. And after the age of two, it's really a game about rewiring, 
So that's extremely an important thing to think about and why timing of the injury is extremely important when we talk about brain development. So again, just to reiterate this point, up until the age of two, it's a numbers game, right? The brain is dividing cells and replicating and it's, and it's really trying to bring as much neuronal machinery or brain machinery as possible. After the age of two, as I said, it's a refinement game. It's trying to work with what it has and forming connections. After the age of two, we have something what's referred to as the critical period, which again, probably something you've all heard of. And the critical period is the stage during which the brain is especially sensitive to environmental stimuli, right? And in humans, this corresponds approximately between the ages of two and seven. So during this period, after the age of two, the brain is extremely sensitive to environmental stimuli. So that could be vision, it could be language, it could be hearing, all sorts of things. So this is when the brain is very, very receptive and forming those new connections based on the machinery that it has. As I mentioned, typically we think of this critical period as, as between somewhere two and seven years. But the reality is, is that this critical period, it really lasts throughout a lifetime. It certainly is, the changes are less and less obvious but I don't want you to think that at seven years old, things stop. The brain is still very, very receptive to change. That's what learning is. But it's important to realize that during these early years, that's when the brain is particularly sensitive to change as well. The last thing I'll mention that I think is quite interesting is notice those of you again who have who have toddlers at home. Remember the terrible twos, right? That's a big, big shift for a child, right? At the age of two, what seems to be happening? They start vocalizing. There's this sort of uh, um, identification of self. They just tend to throw tantrums. They're trying to figure out emotionally what's going on, and that's interesting because it coincides with this really rapid change in strategy from a brain development standpoint. Because again, at the age of two, that's when there's this dramatic change of numbers to wiring. So think of it as the brain, again, trying to come together with the information that it has to lay out its overall organization. Another comment that I think it's important to keep in mind, this is a, a great slide by a colleague named Takao Hench. And he really highlights the fact that different aspects of brain development have different critical periods. We know that sensory systems like vision, hearing, taste, touch, and so on are generally the first systems to come online. And then motor and language tends to come online after that. And then finally, we have higher cognition, executive functions, decision making, et cetera, et cetera. And this is important because if there's anything that happens early on, it tends to create a cascade of events. So if there's somehow an impairment of sensory development, we can anticipate that this actually spills out or has a knock-on effect, if you will, on different aspects of brain development as well. So it's an important thing to think about that periods of opportunity are also windows of potential vulnerability as well. So again, the timing of injury is extremely important. I'll have a little bit more to say about that in just a second. So just to recap this idea about development and how to build a brain, as I mentioned, in the early phases, it's a numbers game right? The, the cells are dividing and dividing and dividing, and it's trying to put all the neural machinery that it has up until about the age of two or three. After that, the brain switches strategies. It becomes more of a pruning strategy. So in other words, it's more about refining the connections and how brain cells and brain areas talk to one another. So again, that transition is extremely important because the same injury occurring prior to the age of two is very, very different than the same injury occurring after the age of two. And that's exactly why, is because what the brain is doing at that time has a lot to say about the impact that that injury may have in terms of brain development. And just to give you an example, to, to sort of drive this, this point home on, on the level of visual perception. So this is an estimation, nice work by a guy named Alex Wade, who has looked at uh, how visual acuity develops uh, over time. So this is what a, a face would look like for a newborn and at four weeks old, eight weeks old, three months old and six months old. So in a very, very short period of time is six months. Look how dramatic the change is. But from six months to adult, it's really not that dramatic a change, but it's much more about fine tuning. So again, just to give you some perspective that systems are coming online 
in the early phases. And again, after this two, three year period, it's really more about fine tuning the system that's already there. So I, again, gives you an appreciation that development is not linear. It's not something that just slowly incrementally gets better every year. It's, there are these bursts, there are these windows of opportunity and the rest of life is very, very much about re, just fine tuning and working with the machinery that's available. A comment about brain injury and why timing matters. And for this, I use something what's called the clock analogy. So people ask me, for example, what's the difference about having damage to the brain later in life versus damage to the brain earlier in life? And it's really, really quite dramatic because this obviously has impact in terms of our education and habilitation versus rehabilitation strategies, right? So think of it this way. If I have a clock that's fully working, right? And I drop that clock and it's damaged. The error in time that the clock has is a reflection of the parts of the clock that are damaged, right? And the, brain, uh, the clock, I should say, is trying to tell time with the pieces that are still working, right? So much like the analogy that we're going to have for our brain. In contrast, if the brain is injured early, like going back to our clock analogy, the problem is, is that it's a clock or a brain that's still developing, right? It's still forming its pieces and its connections together. So it too will have an error in how it tells time, right? This clock, this clock analogy, but it also tells us that those changes could be very, very different. So again, just to recap, in the case of, uh, of a brain injury occurring late in life, you have development that occurs and then the hit happens later on in life. In contrast to an early brain injury where that hit happens early, that naturally puts the individual on a different developmental trajectory. And again, that's really, really important because the strategies we use for a sensory impairment or a motor impairment that occurs later in life may not necessarily be as effective for a strategy that we would use for an individual that has that same sensory or motor impairment early in life. Why? Because the brains are fundamentally different. They're on different trajectories. And that's really the take home message from there. So this, you know, so timing, the severity, extent, the location, these are all variables that we need to kind of keep into our, in our heads as we make a decision in terms of what type of strategies we should develop for an individual. Developmental stage, cognitive capacity, reserve, these are all important factors. And of course, environments is extremely important as well. Support mechanisms, access to rehabilitation or habilitation uh, strategies. All these factors come into play. And like I say, put the individual on a different trajectory once we consider all these variables. All right, so that's just what I wanted to say in terms of the brain overall, in terms of structure and function. Um, obviously, a lot of information kind of compacted, but I, I really wanted to just use this as an introduction to make sure we're all on the same page before we start off with the visual system and visual perception. So Pam, I'm not sure if there's any sort of burning, burning questions or clarifications that I can, I can offer for this first part. We just did have one question yeah. and it was regarding a student that had a hemispherectomy. Mm. And um, she was wondering how that would affect the student if they have half of, of their thalamus missing. Excellent. So, so great question. If it's all right, could we leave that uh, question for the very, very end? Um, anything, because it's, it's, it's a great question and it takes a lot of development, but anything sort of related to particular individuals, if it's okay, if we leave that to the end, just because I think it's going to be a lot of back and forth and just to kind of keep the momentum of the, um, of the slides. Is that all right? Sure. I think that'll Excellent. be fine. Okay, mm -hmm. perfect. Anything specific to the comments that I made? Uh, for this first part? Anything that, that wasn't clear or uh, that I could go over again? You seem to be okay, Pat? Okay, good, excellent. All right, so the second part now, we'll move specifically into the visual system and visual perception. So a couple of quotes that I really, really like that I think are um, important and kind of drive home the conversation this morning was a great quote by Aristotle who said or tried to define what it means to see and he said to see is to know what is where by looking and I think that's really really a great great quote because that 
really encapsulates exactly what seeing is. And those of you probably already know that what an object is and where that object is, is handled by different parts of the brain. And, and if it's not something that's familiar to you, we'll, we'll spend more time on this. And looking in this particular case means moving the eyes. And again, that's a really, really nice succinct phrase to explain what seeing is all about. It's knowing what an object is, where it is, and being able to move my eyes in order to get a good sampling and a sense of the visual world around me. The second quote that I really like is from Helen Keller, which of course you're all familiar with. And she said, the only thing worse than being blind is having sight, but no vision. And I think that's a wonderful quote as well, because I think hopefully you'll understand that sight is one aspect, but vision is a much more complicated aspect. And having vision is much more than just being able to see. And again, when we speak specifically about neuroplasticity, I hope that that's going to uh, be more clear to you as well. All right. So sight is really has to do with visual information coming in, but vision has to do with how you process that visual, that information. And that's really a whole level of abstraction that, that's much higher. So another analogy, as you can guess by now, I like using analogies to try to explain various concepts is I like to break down the visual system, thinking about it like a digital camera, right? So if you've, if you've played around with the digital camera, you'll know that there's really two key components. The first is the lens, right, itself. And this is the optics of the camera. This is the part of the camera that's responsible for focusing in depth. And it's also important for allowing how much light comes into the camera. But there's also a second part of a digital camera, and that is the camera body. This is the processing part. This is the part of the camera that takes that information, that image, that light coming into the camera, and analyzes it. And after a quick second or after a quick delay, generates a picture that, if all goes well, is closely uh, resembles or closely approximates the visual scene that you're looking at, right? So it's important to think about a digital camera into two steps. There is an optics component and there is a processing component. And the human visual system, the mammalian visual system is very, very much the same way. It can be broken down into these two steps. The eye itself is the optical component. And you can see it actually looks quite similar. And I chose this picture on, on purpose, as you might imagine. The eye is very, very important for focusing, moving the lens, changing the size of the lens, or focusing what you're looking at in depth. And the pupil is very, very important for allowing and controlling how much light enters the eye as well. The brain is the processing part of the visual system, right? This is what's taking the incoming information, entering the eye, synthesizing it, analyzing it, and creating a representation of the visual world that you're looking at. The reason why it's important to break down these two components is because this obviously has an important impact clinically and from an educational standpoint, because visual impairment occurring at the level of the eye and the strategies we use are not necessarily the same as the strategies that we would use if there was an impairment at the level of the brain or processing, right? So it's important to kind of think about it. Similarly, if you had a camera and there was a problem with the lens, you would change the lens. You wouldn't change the processor. Similarly, if you had a problem with the processor of your camera, it doesn't matter how many lenses you put in front, it's still not going to give you good images. So both are important, both have to work, and we also have to understand the components or the contribution of the two systems in order to figure out how to, to repair the system or to, to work with the system if it's ever damaged. A little bit more information about visual pathways. And again, this is probably a review for most of you, but just a couple of highlights that I think are important. It's important to realize that the visual world that we perceive is has what's referred to as a retinotopic organization. And retinotopy means that the visual world in space is time, is, excuse me, the visual world in space is organized and mapped onto the visual cortex in, in space as well. So two neighbors in the visual world, two areas of the brain that are side by side are actually two neighbors at the surface of the brain as well, the visual cortex. So the brain, the visual brain keeps a spatial register 
of the visual world. And that registration is maintained throughout the visual system. And this again is called retinotopy. So what do I mean by that? You'll notice that if we go through the visual pathways from the eye, the optic chiasm where information crosses, into the optic tracts, into the thalamus, and these optic radiations to the back of the visual cortex, what are some important takeaways? You'll notice that information that's on the left, which I'm showing you in red and blue, is processed with the right hemisphere. Conversely, information that's on the right is processed by the left hemisphere. So left is processed by right, right is processed by left. So there's a crossing of information. The second thing you'll notice is that it's also upside down. What is red and blue, or sorry, excuse me, a red and green in the superior visual field is actually handled by the lower bank of the visual cortex. Conversely, what's in the lower visual field is handled by the superior bank of the visual cortex. So up is down, down is up. And again, that's important because if there's particular damage to the visual cortex, there is a correspondence to where that visual deficit would be. And the last thing that I want to, uh, to stress upon is you'll notice that the central visual field here, right, this foveal area, this very, very small area of high detail is overrepresented by the time you get to the cortex. So in other words, central vision, the brain dedicates a lot more processing power overall for that central vision the, uh, or, or, or that area of highest acuity or highest scrutiny. So there's a disproportionate amount of information or a disproportionate amount of neural machinery that's dedicated to central parts of vision versus the periphery. And we'll get back to why that's important in just a second. So again, just to recap, left is right, right is left, up is down, down is up. And the central visual field has a lot more machinery or hardware dedicated to scrutinizing uh, compared to uh, to perceiving the, the, the peripheral visual field. I mentioned again this optic chiasm where information crosses, and this is actually very, very important because it's very, very significant clinically. The reason why is because, again, going back to the structural and functional relationship, we know that if an individual has an impairment in one eye, one part of the visual field, for example, that they can't see, 99% of the time, that means that the damage is in front of the chiasm. It's somewhere at the level of the eye or the optic nerve as it reaches the chiasm, right? So if the, if the visual impairment is in one eye or is in one visual field, I should say, but the other eye say is intact, chances are very, very good that somewhere the damage is in front of the chiasm. In contrast, if the visual fields appear symmetrical, right? Let's say they're both, what, what I'm showing you here is a right hemianopia, for example. Then I know that the damage is behind the chiasm because of this crossover. And this is very, very important clinically because if, again, if I have a sense of how each eye sees, it automatically allows me, or at least gives me a very, very good indication of where I think that damage is along the pathway. And patients will often tell me this. I have patients, for example, with a right hemianopia, and they'll say there's something wrong with my right eye. But in reality, if I close one eye, they see that the deficit is there. If they close the other eye, they see the deficit is there. That tells you that the damage is not at the level of the eye. The damage is actually at the level of the brain. So knowing the difference between what's in front of the chiasm and what's behind the chiasm is very, very important to help you understand where the localization of that impairment or that damage could be. So again, just the front of the chiasm as I showed you here and after the chiasm as I'm showing you here. All right, nice video here that I like uh, just to share with you. In this video here, we're showing how information leaves the eye, enters the thalamus, uh, which is referred to as the lateral geniculate nucleus. It's a very important nucleus for relaying visual information to the back of the brain. And in this part of the video that I'm showing you here, you see how that information crosses at the level of the chiasm right here. So information leaving the eyes, crossing the chiasm, and then going on to the back of the visual cortex, right? So a nice video, I think, that shows how information uh, is sent to the back of the brain and this crossing of information as well. Step by step, let's talk a little bit about the eye. And the eye itself, a little bit, you know, a bit of a departure, I should say, of my, of my camera um, analogy. 
the eye is not only an optical component, as you all know, which is responsible for focusing. We know that individuals can be farsighted or hypermetropic. We know that individuals can be nearsighted or myopic, and we use corrective lenses so that the focusing is right into the macula or into the fovea so that that, that person sees the image sharply. So the eye has a very, very important optical role to play. And the pupil, of course, opens and closes and controls the amount of light coming in. But the also important thing to think about is the retina is the light sensitive part of the eye as well, right? And embryonically, the retina is part of the brain. So as that light enters the eye and hits the retina, we have specific receptors called rods and cones that collect that light information and then send it out of the eye to be further processed by the brain, all right? Once it leaves the eye, it forms the optic nerve and enters these subcortical structures that I was mentioning early on in my presentation, right? These are subcortical structures that are important for relaying the information back to the visual cortex. And there are three in particular that are important to think about. The LGN or the lateral geniculate nucleus is an important thalamic nucleus that again, collects that information, consolidates it at the level of, a, of the thalamus and again, sends it to the back of the brain. The pulvinar is another nucleus that's very important for visual attention and orienting the eyes and again, communicating between the cortex and the thalamus. And the superior colliculus, which is a midbrain structure, is very, very important for moving the eyes as well, right? So deep structures into the brain, really the, really the interface between information coming to the eye and then sending the information to the back of the brain, the visual cortex for further processing. Once we're at the visual cortex, the primary visual cortex, it's very interesting to realize that a visual image is broken down. So at the level of the primary visual cortex, what we call V1, it's essentially a sketch of, of the image that's coming in, right? So here we have the image that we're, we're looking at. You can see how the primary visual cortex is just kind of breaking it down into sort of a rudimentary image. The next step or the next level in the processing is called V2. And this is where the two eyes come together. The images of the two eyes are fused in order to get depth perception. And then it continues to climb. We know that area V3 is very important for form. This is the part of the brain that's scrutinizing the overall shape of the target that you're looking at or the object that you're looking at. V4 is the part of the brain responsible for color perception. So analyzing and scrutinizing or perceiving the color of the various things that you're looking at. And V5 is responsible for the motion of that particular object that you're looking at. And this continues higher and higher and higher order areas. We know that, for example, there are parts of the visual cortex that are responsible for face perception, what's called FFA or face fusiform area. And just incidentally, these areas are not anatomically correct. I'm just trying to break down, showing you that, that it's really important to realize that once visual information enters the cortex, the brain, it's broken down. And the job of the visual cortex is to put it all back together again. All these areas have to talk to one another. And today we've identified something over like 30 visual areas, each one involved with the scrutinizing of various aspects of a visual scene or a visual object. And they have to talk to one another to integrate that information in order to make sense of the visual world around us. So let's spend a little bit more time about this and why that's actually important. Another way to think about this organization of visual areas is to realize that there is a division of labor. We know that visual areas of the visual cortex that are responsible for where an object is in space. And these are visual areas that lie from the occipital cortex up along into the parietal cortex and also ultimately into the frontal cortex. We call this the dorsal or the spatial processing stream. So these are visual areas responsible for where objects are in space. In contrast, we have another pathway that goes from the occipital cortex going down to the temporal cortex. And this is referred to as the ventral or what stream. And this is the visual pathway responsible for object perception or object identification. So it's color, it's texture, it's overall identification. This visual repertoire that you're familiar with sits or resides in the temporal cortex. So this division of labor, where an object is and what that object is, is actually handled in two separate 
parallel processing pathways. It's a very, very useful way to think about the organization of the visual system, but I want to really stress upon the fact that even though they're laid out as two parallel streams, they really talk to one another extensively. And there's a lot more and more research demonstrating the connections between these two er these two streams. And there's a lot of crosstalk between these two areas. So even though they may be handling information in a parallel fashion, they're in constant communication with one another. And that communication is extremely important as you might imagine, right? Nice figure that I like here. This is a simplified view of the visual system of all the visual areas that I talked about. So it's really quite striking just how many areas are involved with the perception or the analysis of a visual scene. And just to kind of give you some perspective, the eye, the thalamus and the primary visual cortex are in these three areas that I circulated here at the very, very bottom in three. So from the eye to the thalamus to the primary visual cortex, that's just this. Right? You still have all this in terms of cortical processing that you need to account for. So just thinking about the eye, the thalamus to the visual cortex is really just a small part of the overall machinery that's required. And I think very quickly you can get an appreciation that any damage to this system, any one of these pathways that could, that could be damaged could throw the whole system off. And I think you get an appreciation of just how vulnerable the visual system could be to, to an injury or, or a developmental issue, for example. All these pieces have to come together and work properly and work in synchrony. Um, let's move now to visual perception. And this figure is actually different than the one that you have in your, in your slide deck. I just came across this uh, over the weekend. I just thought it was an interesting picture. Image of a hallway with lined carpet giving the idea of small hills and valleys. What I'm showing you here is a hallway. And if you look at the carpet, you'll notice how these lines kind of give you this indication that there are all these sort of divots in there, right? Hopefully if you're looking at that, you'll, you'll see what I mean. Of course, the, the carpet is, the floor is completely flat. The carpet is completely flat. But it's interesting how playing with the lines gives you this perception that there's all these divots and these holes as you walk through uh, the hallway. And it's a great example of why just studying the anatomy of the visual system tells you only a certain amount of information. How you perceive the visual world really has a lot to do with how it's analyzing. So in other words, visual perception is a construction. It's an active process. It's how it takes information in and creates an internal model in the mind of what it thinks it's looking at. So I think a nice example of that. If you're wondering why uh, this carpet was laid out, it's actually quite interesting. It turns out this is a hotel and they decided to do this to keep kids from running in the hallway. <laughs> so I think they feel that if they, if they see these so-called holes that they'll actually slow down. So I thought it was an interesting picture. And again, to kind of give you this idea about how perception can change indeed behavior. Here's another great example of what I mean by perception, right? Uh, a visual illusion, very famous, that came out in 1915. I'm not sure if any of you have seen this before. Um, we'll do a little sort of test together. This picture here, you should be able to see one of two things. You should see either an old lady or you should see a young girl. And hopefully all of you are able to do this, right? So you'll see either an old lady or a young girl. And I'll give you a second to kind of sort of take that in, right? So here's to orient you. If you see the old lady, this is going to be her nose, this is her mouth, and there's her chin. If you see the young girl, she's actually looking away from you. So this would be her cheek, that's her ear, and that's her nose, and that would be her eyelash, right? So hopefully now you should be able to see both forms, right? The interesting thing about this is you notice that you can't see both at the same time. You have to see one or the other. You can't see both. It's what's called a bistable illusion. And the reason why this is interesting is the fact that the image that's landing onto your retina is identical. I've never changed the image, but your perception changes based on your anticipation, based on your preconceived notions of what you're looking for. Right, So I think, again, illustrates that to see, or vision per se, is only the beginning process. Vision is really an analysis, right? There's another piece to this illusion that I think is really quite interesting. I'm certainly not going to single anybody out. It turns out what you see, whether it's a young girl or an old lady, is correlated to how old you are. 
the older you are, the more likely you're going to see the old lady. And the younger you are, the more likely you're going to see the young girl. So it's actually quite interesting that there's a, course, a correlation between perception and your age in this particular case. So again, a nice example of how visual perception is largely influenced by who we are. The world that we perceive is very much influenced by the way that our previous notions are our previous experiences. So here's an example of why I think, uh, or, or trying to illustrate the importance of integrating visual information. So here's a task we'll do together. Obviously everybody is, is gonna do this on their own, but here is your task. I'm gonna show you a visual scene and I want you to find the blue O, right? Here we go. Found it? Tony, you're gonna to help me. You're gonna raise your hand if you see it. Do you see it? Yeah, easy enough, right? Thanks, Tony. Okay, I'm gonna give you another example. Here it is, right? Very, very easy. I'm gonna give you another example. You ready? Find the blue O. You raise it when you see it for me. Okay, here we go. Go ahead, Tony. You see it, yeah? Easy, right? Not too tough. Here's the last one, you ready? Here we go, find the blue O. Still looking? Tick, 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 tick. <laughs> it's a lot harder, isn't it? Yeah, a lot, lot harder. There, now you got it, very good. Just to show you, I'm a nice guy. There's actually two of them, right? I actually gave you a little chance. So why did it take so much time? Thank you, Tony, for, this, for helping me with this, uh, this demonstration. So why was it harder, so much harder in this particular task? So let's kind of break this down for a second. When I asked you to locate the target based on shape, you were using your shape area to scrutinize this visual scene. When I asked you to identify the same target based on color, the unique feature was color, you were using your color processing area. But when I combined the two, your color area and your shape area or your form area had to talk to one another, right? And that takes time and that integration is extremely important. So it's a very simple demonstration of how these visual areas need to talk to one another and that processing takes time. And this is a very, very simple scene in the grand scheme of things, right? You can imagine that in a very complex naturalistic visual scene, the brain is constantly trying to scrutinize, take this information in, integrating that information, and that is really an important thing to think about. So anything that can perturb that, any connections or any areas that aren't working properly, you can then have an appreciation of why the, visual, the, the, the perception of that visual scene can break down. So the integration of information is extremely important, right? Last thing I wanna mention in this particular area is that vision, as I mentioned, is an active process. It's not just about the image that lands onto the eye. It's about how the brain takes that information and works with it. So an important thing to realize is we don't notice, or perhaps more accurately, we don't process the majority of information that enters the eyes. And a lot of people maybe find that surprising. There's a lot of information that enters the eye, but the brain is not processing all of it simultaneously. It's actually picking and strategically determining what it needs to look at in order to understand the visual scene. And this speaks to the fact that the visual system, there is a fundamental limit or capacity that the visual system and the brain can handle at any given time, right? Because it cannot look at everything and scrutinize everything equally at the same time. It is strategically looking at the visual world and making a hypothesis, an inner model of what it sees. Right, And a good example of this is this. So if I were to look at this particular visual scene, at any given time, this is exactly what your visual brain were exactly. This is a simulation of what your visual brain would see. Only a small area in the fovea, in the center, would be of color and a very, very high resolution. The rest of the visual scene is monochromatic, meaning black and white, and of much lower resolution. Right. So the question is, how does the visual brain figure out and see the visual world around us? Well, the answer is it moves the eyes. So by moving the eyes, essentially what you're doing is taking a series of snapshots, very, very quick, high resolution snapshots, and the visual brain is stitching those pictures together, right? So over time, the brain is stitching a high resolution representation of the visual scene, right? It's constructing a visual, a mental representation of what it's looking at. 
So eye movements are very, very important because how we move our eyes in the visual scene reflects the content of the visual scene, right? And in reality, the brain is deciding what to look at and where to look and what we should pay attention to. So eye movements are very, very important because it's a window into the brain. It gives us a chance to understand what the brain is actually looking at and scrutinizing. So a very, very detailed image. The only thing that I want to sort of drive home now is that we have ways experimentally, and I'll show you how we're doing this in the case of CVI, of tracking eye movements in a very, very simple and non-invasive manner. When I, when I was a fellow, to track eye movements, you needed this big, big contraption, you know, on your head and cameras, and it was very, very heavy and, and not realistic. But today, the technology is really quite simple. We use a particular device called a Toby Eye Tracker. There are many devices out there. This is, just happens to be one that we use. Um, it's, it's quite nice because you can plug it in into your existing computer, and the tracker is tracking the reflections on the surface of your eyes and using that as a way, as an index to see where you're looking on a particular uh, particular visual scene or whatever image you're showing on the computer screen. And this works actually quite well, even in infants, because there are no cables or anything that the child has to wear or the participant has to wear, it's a very, very easy way to record eye movement. So it's a very, very robust system. The other thing I want to, to drive home is that when you're studying eye movements, you're really looking at a lot of the visual system and the brain in general. You're looking not only at the eyes working as a team, you're looking at subcortical structures that are responsible for moving the eyes. You're also looking at the visual cortex, obviously. You're also looking at the parts of the brain and frontal areas for attention and memory. So when you study eye movements, you're really seeing a lot of the brain in action. And that's why I think looking at visual search paradigms or eye movements in general are very, very revealing into how the person is perceiving the visual world. And let me show you some historical examples of that really sort of drives this point home. This was a classic study done by a gentleman named Yarbus, one of the very first individuals to, to get um, to sort of study this in a, in a very, very comprehensive manner. And what he did is he showed this picture to individuals who were wearing a very old contraption, one of the first designs of an eye tracking system. And he would show this picture to participants and he would record their eye movements. And he said, just look at this picture. And this is what their patterns looked like. So these white dots are where the person fixated and the white lines is where the eyes moved, right? And what you notice under this free examination uh, condition, where do you look at? You notice that it's not uniform throughout the visual scene. You notice that we pay attention to things that are highly relevant and interesting. Faces, for example, objects on the table, for example. And we spend a lot less time on things that are pretty uniform and not very, very telling, so to speak. So the brain picks areas of a visual scene that it thinks can tell you a lot about what you're looking at, right? The next step, which I think is very, very interesting, he said, okay, fine. Now, instead of just freely exploring this visual scene, I want you to estimate the material wealth of the family in the picture. And certainly at that time, how you dressed was a good indicator of how wealthy you were. And what do you notice? Look at the eye movements now, very, very different. We're not looking at the faces anymore or the room. I think we're looking at how people are dressed, right? Because this is a, probably a good proxy or a good indicator of how wealthy a particular individual is. So again, same image, scrutinized completely differently based on the task at hand. So again, the brain decides what to look at. That's the take home message from this sort of classic experience. Clinically, we know that eye movements are very helpful as well. We know, for example, children who are on the spectrum, who have autism spectrum disorder, for example, what do we know typically about these children? They don't maintain eye contact, right? So here's an example of three children. This is a, an image of a, an individual. These are the eye tracking recordings of three different individuals for neurotypical development. Here it is from three children with ASD. And what do you notice? They do not make contact at the level of the eyes. So really sort of um, uh, some objective data demonstrating something that you know, that you suspect clinically, that indeed that typically children with ASD don't typically make contact with the eyes, right? So again, you can use this technology to confirm that. And the last example that I think is quite interesting, this was done by a gentleman named Jeremy Wolf here in Boston. What he looked at was the role of experience 
and eye movements. So he did a task with novice radiologists and the task was to look at a chest X-ray and there was a tumor and then they actually looked at the pattern of a novice radiologist to find where that tumor was. And what do you notice? A lot of movements, right? Scattering all over the place, darting all over the place until finally finding it. But an expert radiologist, what do you notice? The movements are fewer for starters, much more crisp and finally getting to the target much quicker. And this is extremely important because what this means is that visual search can be learned. It can be a learned behavior based on training, based on experience. And good visual search or good visual perception is not just about knowing where to look. It's also about knowing where not to look. So creating an efficient system that can hone in on information in the visual scene that is particularly salient, particularly helpful, in order to create a more efficient visual perceptual system. All right, so we'll take a pause again. This was uh, just to recap uh, about the visual system from an, ana an anatomical standpoint, but also from a perceptual standpoint. Pam, again, I'll turn it over to you. Are there any questions on this particular section before we move to neuroplasticity and CVI? I don't see any in the chat right now. Still Does fine. anybody have anything they need to? learn about right now? Could it wait for the Q&A section? Again, ju just a reminder, if you have um, a question about a particular individual or a particular case, please save that for the general discussion at the end because it's probably gonna be a much longer, much longer um, discussion. But if you have specific questions, as Pam said, about brain structure and function, visual system and visual perception, uh, things that I, maybe I can clarify before we move on, please, please go ahead. Looks okay. Excellent, very good. So now we'll move to our final and perhaps the most interesting part, uh, thinking about neuroplasticity, visual impairment, and the specific case of CVI. So obviously what I tried to do is give you a little bit of a groundwork about, about brain structure and function and visual system and perception. Now we're going to study how the brain adapts and changes in the specific case of visual impairment. And we'll talk not only about uh, CVI in the case of a brain-based visual impairment, but we'll also talk about some of the earlier work in neuroscience and neuroplasticity in the case of ocular blindness as well. So anytime again, when I, when I talk about this topic, there, I think there are a number of things that are important to highlight when you get into the subject of visual impairment overall. And the first is the timing and localization of visual impairment and blindness. And there are four scenarios that I think that are important to distinguish. So certainly there are individuals who are born blind with some sort of ocular-based disease or eye-based disease, right? So they are born blind or, or early in their development, they, they have blindness due to some sort of eye disease or, uh, or eye pathology right? Retinopathy of prematurity, for example, is a good example. There are various diseases, as I mentioned, like Leber's the congenital amaurosis is, uh, is another condition that affects the eye very, very early in development. And that individual uh, is visually impaired throughout their lifetime because of this early issue at the level of the eye. We also know that it's possible to have acquired eye blindness or eye or eye based visual impairment. That is to say that the individual has neurotypical development in terms of their vision. And later in life, they develop some pathology or some disease at the level of the eye. So macular generation is a big one in the United States and developed countries. So this is an example of an individual who has neurotypical development of vision, but then becomes visually impaired or blind later in life. Very, very different presentation. You also know that there are individuals who have neurotypical development and may have damage to the brain. So in other words, become visually impaired because of damage or trauma, for example, like a stroke or, or trauma, as I mentioned, at the level of the visual brain, right? So these are individuals, again, intact uh, visual system or visual processing and become visual impaired later in life because of damage at the level of the brain. And there is a fourth population, which of course you all know, are individuals who are visually impaired early in life, not because of something happening at the level of the eye, but rather because of a developmental trauma or injury occurring at the level of the brain early in life. And this, of course, I'm referring to CVI. So it's important to distinguish these four scenarios based on location and timing of the visual impairment. The second point that I wanna make is that it's really, really quite dramatic from 
visual impairment occurring at adulthood versus childhood. And this is data for some friends and colleagues from the United, uh, United Kingdom who have been uh, tracking a lot of these uh, registry studies. And what you see that in adults, when you talk about visual impairment and blindness, you're largely talking about problems at the level of the eye. Age-related macular degeneration, glaucoma, diabetic retinopathy are all problems and diseases occurring at the level of the eye. When you talk about visual impairment in children, you're largely talking about the brain, right? And we know that the overwhelming majority of children who have visual impairment is because of a problem occurring at the level of the brain, not necessarily at the eye. The two can co-occur together, but the brain is the big driver for visual impairment when we talk about children. And that's extremely important. So visual impairment, blindness in adults, is really about the eye. Visual impairment and blindness in children, it's really about the brain. And as you might imagine, those probably take different assessments, different strategies, different education programs, different treatment strategies. So how we handle children with visual impairment is probably gonna be very, very different on how we handle adults with visual impairment. Now, the last thing I'm going to mention with this is that this is an evolving public health concern, right? This isn't something that was occurring 20, 30 years ago. It was very, very different 20, 30 years ago. It is now something that has changed considerably. And in fact, it was a project that we didn't look for. It was a project that came to us. And I'll give you more details about that in terms of our relationship and our colleagues here in the Boston area. So let's talk specifically about the issue of neuroplasticity, a term that I'm sure you're all familiar with. Um, I'll give you a little bit of historical background of where the term comes from. Neuro, obviously the brain. Plasticity comes from the Greek word plastikos, which means to mold or to shape. So neuroplasticity is the quality of being easily shaped and molded. And just like a piece of plastic or pieces of plastic can be molded into different shapes and different functions or different uh, objects, so too can the brain. Under different conditions and different uh, environmental uh, uh, scenarios, the brain can also change its shape and its function as well. So this is what we mean by neuroplasticity. Here is a functional definition uh, or, or an operative de definition that I like to use is neuroplasticity is the ability of the brain to change its structural and functional organization. And notice the two words there are underlined, again, structure and function in response to development, experience, the environment, or damage. The important thing to think about this is that it's not a guaranteed fix, right? I have a lot of patients and, and, and families, for example, in my brain injury clinic who tell me, okay, fine, you know, when, when's the plasticity going to kick in? You know, when, when is this all going to just come back to normal? And unfortunately, it's not that simple, right? Neuroplasticity isn't necessarily a good or a bad thing. It's a fact of life. It's an intrinsic property of how the brain works. And what we have to understand as teachers, as neuroscientists, as clinicians, is what are those parameters that influence neuroplasticity? And how can we steer it and guide it in a way that is optimal for the recovery or the education or the habilitation of a particular individual? That's really the core concept of, of trying to understand and study this particular phenomenon. Let me give you a great example of neuroplasticity that I think really drives home this point about compensatory strategies and how the brain can rewire itself based on various uh, environmental scenarios. This is a picture actually that hands in, uh, that's hanging in my office right now. And I like it because it really sort of drives home this idea. So I will tell you a little bit about um, this particular uh, individual. Uh, this was a picture taken by um, a photographer named David Seymour after the Second World War. And what he did is he, he went around Europe after the Second World War taking pictures of children to really try to drive home the plight the children were going through after the war as towns were trying to get reconstruction and rebuilt and, and, and so on. And he found this particular young boy in Italy. And this young boy was born blind. And like many children in his situation, he learned to read Braille as a form of communication. One day, unfortunately, he was out in the field playing with his friends and he picked up something that he shouldn't have. And that object was a landmine. The landmine exploded, destroyed both his hands and became a double amputee. He can still read Braille not because he sees the dots, but it's because he's using the surface of his nose and his lips to read, to, 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 to feel the dots and read uh, the actual text. And I'm showing you another picture here. So here you can see the child with a very, very enlarged print size of Braille, and he's using his nose and his lips to read the Braille dots. 
So really a dramatic example of neuroplasticity or compensatory neuroplasticity, the brain rewiring itself using another input mechanism in order to carry out the jobs of perception that it, that it needs to do. So really a dramatic example of neuroplasticity in this particular case. So this brings up an interesting story in the, in, in the, in the scenario of visual deprivation or blindness. And is it somehow an advantage? And there's a lot of interesting work in the neuroscience realm that has tried to, to dig at, uh, at this question. Let me give you the example of Stevie Wonder, who you all know. This is an individual who lost, who became profoundly blind very, very early um, in, uh, in his youth. And of course, became an incredibly talented and very, very successful uh, musician, which I'm sure you've all, you've all heard his music. There's an interesting philosophical question. And the question is, was his blindness somehow an advantage? In other words, did he become an incredibly talented and successful musician related to the fact that he was blind early in life? So in other words, if Stevie Wonder wasn't born blind or lost his vision early at a young age, would he still be the same individual today? And I think that's an interesting philosophical question, but it's also a very, very interesting uh, neuroscience question as well. And there is indeed a lot of evidence that in the case of early ocular blindness, these blind individuals or these individuals with ocular blindness show compensatory behaviors across the senses. So there's evidence, for example, that the ocular blind individuals have a keener sense of touch. They have, or I should say, are, have a, um, or, or uh, a keener sense of touch, as I said, or are better at localizing sound and space, also identifying certain smells. They also have superior verbal memory recall in terms of uh, various tasks. So for example, if I give a list of 10 words and I ask them to come back a month later to recall those words, they actually do better than aged matched uh, sighted controls. So it's quite interesting that in the case of ocular blindness or early ocular blindness, we see these compensatory behaviors across various senses and functions, but there are caveats to this particular observation. It's not every individual that shows these compensatory behaviors, first of all. And second, it's not in every situation. And third, there's another way that you can look at it. The question becomes, are, are, are individuals who are blind necessarily better or is it because sighted individuals are really bad if you blindfold them or you ask them to use this or do the same task as well? So it's not a two ways that you can actually look at this. The second piece that's quite interesting is thinking about overall brain development. You know that the visual cortex is a large, large part of the brain. So the question now begs the question, or, or I should say this begs the question that if you were born blind due to an ocular cause, what is the developmental fate of all of these brain areas that are normally responsible for visual perception? And this also was studied extensively by a number of individuals using a technique called functional neuroimaging. And I'll again, show you some data from that as well. So what I'm showing you here is from a PET scan. This is a congenitally blind individual or group of congenitally blind individuals. You're looking at a sagittal cut of the brain. So it's going through like this. This is the front of the brain. This is the occipital visual cortex here. And what you notice in these group of congenitally blind individuals, again, from ocular cause, this very, very robust signal, this lighting up, if you will, of the visual cortex. So you might ask, why is the visual cortex active an individual who's never seen before? And the answer is, is that these individuals are reading Braille. So it turns out that in the case of early onset ocular blindness, blind individuals or individuals with profound ocular blindness use their visual cortex to process non-visual information or non-visual sensory information. Not only in the case of Braille, which is obviously tactile, but we also have evidence that this is true for auditory uh, localization or sound localization or auditory tasks. We also know this is true for smell or olfaction. And we also know that this is true for verbal memory. So that in the case of early onset profound ocular blindness, we know that the visual cortex is functionally recruited to process non-visual information. So it seems that the visual cortex is the seat of compensatory behaviors that we see in the case of individuals with profound ocular blindness. Let me give you an example of why I think, or why, or example, I think to drive home the point of why the occipital or visual cortex is extremely important in this process. Because you might say, well, you know, how do I know that this is true? You know, these, these fancy brain pictures and you're showing me the visual cortex is active, but how do I know it's really, really important uh, 
for these, these compensatory behaviors. And I'm going to share with you a case report that I think drives home this, uh, this issue. So this is a story. So I, I had the chance to work with this individual, but this event happened before I arrived at the hospital. So it's, I'm telling you the story that, that I heard. All right. So at the time, this was a 63-year-old right-handed female. She, was, she had congenital blindness. She had retinopathy of prematurity. Her reported visual acuity was no light perception in both eyes. She hits normal developmental milestones, and she learns to read Braille at the age of six. She's a highly proficient Braille reader. You'll agree with me that 120, 150 symbols per minute is a very, very fast Braille reading speed. In fact, she was the editor of a, of a Braille journal for La Once, which is a, the Spanish organization for the blind in Spain. And every day she was reading, uh, reading Braille text and editing Braille text. So she was a highly, highly experienced Braille reader. One day she wakes up and she has a really, really bad headache. She's not feeling well, but she decides to go to work nonetheless. Again, the headache's getting a little bit worse. She's feeling really, really lightheaded. She has difficulty swallowing. And finally, she, she passes out. She loses consciousness. She's rushed to the hospital. She falls into a 24-hour coma. She wakes up from the coma and she says she's fine. Right. In fact, she's given a normal physical examination by, by the attending staff. Right. So she's lying in bed. The attending staff comes to her and says, you know what, you're all right. You, 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 you fell into a coma, but you're here at the hospital. You're all right. You're safe now. We'd like you to contact various friends and family members so we, you know, so we can contact them on your behalf. And they give her her address book, which, of course, is written in Braille. So she takes the book and she starts reading the text and she says, you know what? I, I, I can't read any of this. I mean, I know it's Braille. I feel, I feel the dumb. I, I feel the bumps, I should say, but I, I have no understanding. I can't make out the text. What happened? She had a stroke. The interesting thing is where the stroke was. It was in her occipital cortex, right? So this woman became alexic for Braille. In other words, the acquired inability to read Braille not because of damage to the part of the brain responsible for language or the part of the brain responsible for touch, but damage to her occipital visual cortex. So what I'm showing you here, these are axial cuts. These are T2 weighted scans. What you see in white is infarcted tissue. So we think what happened was that there was a stroke at the tip of the basilar artery that took out both banks of the visual cortex or the primary visual cortex. And to this day, she is unable to read Braille because of damage to her visual brain. So pretty strong uh, you know, correlational uh, evidence that the visual cortex, again, becomes recruited for this process. And if you damage the visual cortex profoundly, it obviously has a profound impact on her compensatory behaviors. So again, the visual cortex is, is very, very important. To the question, is all plasticity good plasticity? And I think that's an important thing to think about as well. As I mentioned, you know, patients and families will always ask me, you know, what do we need to do to, to crank up the plasticity and so on? Well, the fact is, is that plasticity can be bad as well. You have what's referred to as maladaptive plasticity. Phantom limb pain is a great example of that. You know, there are individuals who become amputees either a limb, uh, you know, it could be their leg, it could be, for example, their hand or their forearm, for example. And these patients will complain of incredible excruciating pain, even though the limb isn't there. They'll say, you know what, I feel like my hand is being crushed, or it's like it's in a vice, even though the hand has been amputated. This is an example of maladaptive plasticity. This is, again, the brain trying to figure out and deal with the information that it's, that it's receiving from the outside world. And in this particular case, it's a maladaptive strategy or a maladaptive response. So again, plasticity, plasticity isn't necessarily a good or a bad thing. It's a fact of life. And what we need to do is how to understand how to steer and control that plasticity in a way that is optimal for recovery of function. All right. So just to recap this first point before we move on to the case of CVI, hopefully I've convinced you that in the case of neuroplasticity or in the case of individuals who are born with congenital profound ocular blindness, the fate of the occipital visual cortex becomes a system or becomes a, an area of the brain that's recruited to process non-visual information. And we think that that's very important for compensatory behaviors in these individuals. The question now is, let's say you were born with your eye intact, but now you have congenital damage to your occipital visual cortex. 
what now happens from a developmental standpoint and compensatory behaviors, et cetera, et cetera. So now we can imagine how we've moved from the scenario of ocular blindness to now the situation of CBI, because that's exactly why we think that the scenarios are different, right? So the developmental trajectory of an individual with early onset ocular blindness is very, very different than an individual who has dam or early damage to visual areas of the brain. All right. As I mentioned, I want to explain to you how we got involved with this project and our relationship from a community standpoint. And I'd like to talk about the Perkins School for the Blind. You're all probably familiar with this, uh, with this school. It's the oldest and first school for the blind in the United States, a uh, school with a long uh, history. Helen Keller was a student here and Sullivan was a teacher here. Um, when I was uh, an optometry uh, fellow, or I should say op optometry student, I was doing my internship. I actually interned at the Perkins School and learned a lot there. And as you might imagine, uh, had a big, big impact impact in terms of uh, my decisions in terms of what I wanted to do from a clinical research standpoint. If you were to look at the classic child who was enrolled at Perkins many, many years ago, you would find a child who was blind due to an ocular cause. In the early years, this could have been from an infection. For example, rubella was a common cause that caused cataracts, for example. And many of these children came to Perkins to learn to read Braille, to learn how to use a, a cane, for example, and develop uh, various skills to remain independent and continue their education. But interestingly, over the past, I would say, 15 to 20 years, the profile of, quote, the classic Perkins child has changed dramatically. What we find now are children who don't just have visual issues, but they have multiple issues. They may have uh, auditory processing issues. They may have sensory motor issues as well. So the profile became much more complex. And in particular, what they found as the visual impairments that these children had were not necessarily related to issues at the level of the eye but rather issues at the level of the brain. And more importantly, what the teachers were noticing is that these classic uh, uh, strategies like learning Braille or learning to use a, a, a cane, for example, were difficult to transfer to this particular population, this new population now. And the question is why? How is it that you have two children, you know, let's say with, with 2,100 visual acuity, one from an eye-based cause and the other related to a brain-based cause, why are they so different, even though their visual uh, impairment could be classified as similar, right? And the reason why is because we think that these individuals are on two very, very different developmental trajectories. And that's really what drives uh, the interest for the project that we're working on right now. So as you know, the profile of children who are enrolled uh, in schools for blind, not just in the United States, but developed countries in general, has changed dramatically over the past 10, 15 years. In fact, cortical visual impairment or cerebral visual impairment, or let's call it CVI for the purposes of this presentation, is now the most common diagnosis or association of visual impairment in the United States and also in developed countries, right? It's really quite dramatic on how this profile has changed. And if you look at this breakdown here, you'll notice things like syphilis, herpes, toxo, cytomegalovirus, these are all infectious causes. You'd have to think that these numbers are gonna continue dropping over time with good public health initiatives and good uh, medical practices and so on. Things like retinitis pigmentosa, Lebers, these are genetic diseases, right? And these are disorders that a lot of people are making great progress in. And you'd have to think that also those numbers are gonna decrease with time. And also retina, uh, retinopathy of prematurity or ROP, this is a condition, well, it turns out we have a lot to do with that. And now a better understanding of what goes on in the, in the NICU or in neonatal um, intensive care we're able to again bring those numbers down as well. So the point I'm trying to make is that over time, what it means to be born blind or, or with a visual impairment is going to look very, very different than how it did 150 or you know 30 years ago. So that profile of visual impairment is going to change considerably. The second thing I'll mention with this, again, something you're probably all familiar with, is where did these kids come from? Why didn't we know about this, say, 30, 40 years ago? And the reason is, is a lot of these conditions or a lot of these brain-based visual impairments, I should say, is related to the fact that we're saving these children. So excellent neonatal care, uh, emergency care. These children were not surviving 20, 30, 40 years ago, but they're surviving today and they're surviving and thriving, but with these developmental complications that we need to account for. And many of them, as you know, have visual related processing issues and visual perceptual issues as well. So this is how we, we got to where we are today, this sort of shift in profile that we're seeing in children with visual impairment.
So let's talk a little bit more about CVI. So cortical visual impairment or cerebral visual impairment or CVI is abnormal visual function despite quote, a normal eye examination. You'll see I have a question mark here. This was the old sort of traditional uh, operational definition, but this has changed considerably because as you all know, many children with CVI do present with, uh, with ocular uh, situations as well. There could be optic nerve head pallor or hypoplasia. There could be an eye churn, for example. There could be significant refractive error. But the key aspect, which I think is a really nice encapsulated by this, this latest definition by Saki in, in 2017, is it's verifiable visual dysfunction associated with damage to retrochiasmal pathways. There again, after the chiasm and cerebral structures that cannot be attributed to disorders of the anterior visual pathways or potentially co-occurring ocular pathology. In other words, these are visual impairments that seem to be mismatched by what we see at the level of the eye. So if we examine the eye, we can't explain what's going on with this particular child. We have to think about this more on a brain-based level to understand the visual impairments that this individual has, right? Visual acuity, as you know, can range from normal to profound blindness, right? Really speaks to the heterogeneity in this population. Visual field deficits are also typically present or can be present. And typically they're in the inferior visual field. And the reason why for that goes back to structure and function, right? Remember the inferior visual field is handled by the superior bank right, of the visual projections. And that's typically near the parietal cortex. And that's where a lot of this damage occurs, particularly in the case of periventricular leukomalacia. So a nice example showing you how visual field impairments relate to the structure and function of the pathways as well. Many have reduced contrast. Some also have ocular motor uh, disorders as well that may be present. But really intriguingly, or an important thing I should say that, that's key into the diagnosis is having a medical history that's consistent with pre or perinatal neurological impairment. That's really the, really the key issue is we need to sort of pin some sort of neurological event that occurred either during development or shortly after birth that we think could associate with some sort of neurological damage and therefore be related to the visual impairments that we see. So some type of injury or uh, impairment, neurological impairment. Typically, we know that there's a strong association with cerebral palsy, for example. Many children with cerebral palsy also have CBI. You can see, for example, situations where a child presents with epilepsy as well. There could be characteristic neuroradiological findings. So in other words, on structural MRI, we could see particular changes, which I'll show you some examples, but not always. And that's important to realize. Just because the structural MRI doesn't show anything doesn't necessarily rule out CVI. And similarly, if you have a child with CVI, it's entirely possible that we don't see any particular damage on a structural MRI as well. So the neuroimaging is helpful, but I don't think it's necessarily the definitive way to, to diagnose it. It's really on a behavioral level and functional level. The assessments are absolutely crucial. We also know that, that often there is the presence of these unique higher order visual processing deficits, uh, visual spatial uh, deficits in particular, complex motion processing deficits, as well as with visual search and attention. And you'll recall that everything I just described here is typically associated with the dorsal processing stream. And indeed, CVI has been characterized as a, a condition of dorsal stream dysfunction. So typically we see these dorsal related functions impaired in these children. And I'll give you again, some, some neuroanatomical evidence that seems to fit with this, with this hypothesis as well. For example, children will often with CVI will often tell me that they have a hard time walking or sitting in a car and perceiving the visual world around them. So moving through the visual field, particularly quickly, really gives is a challenge for them to perceive what's happening around them. Younger children, for example, if you give them their favorite toy, they'll say, yeah, this is my favorite toy. But if I put it in a toy box and ask them to find it, they can't find it, right? And we call these children dumpers. They have to dump their toy box and lay everything out and try to find the, the, the favorite toy with more spacing, for example. Adolescents will tell us in high school, walking through their corridor, high school corridor, they'll walk by their class or maybe they'll walk by a friend or, or somebody that they know. Because again, the crowded environment and moving is a particular challenge for them to perceive what's actually happening. So these are all examples of higher order processing issues, 
right? Um, nice example from some colleagues have put together. We know that also in the case of CVI, visual complexity and demand is something that these individuals are particularly sensitive to. So, you know, there's this classic sort of where's Waldo image. But for a child with CVI, maybe this is what the visual world actually looks like. Much more challenging. A nice, a nice post that came from a, a web page called Start, Start Seeing CVI. So visual complexity is a really characteristic feature, typically with children with, with CVI. And last thing I'll leave you on this particular page, a nice comment by a colleague of mine, Dr. Barry Cran, who is uh, an optometrist working at, uh, at the Perkins uh, Vision Eye Clinic with New England College of Optometry. He really speaks to the heterogeneity in presentation, a lot of these kids with CVI, and he calls it the slot machine analogy, where each one of these sort of tumblers is a particular uh, measurement. So it could be visual acuity, visual field, it could be spatial processing, it could be the ability to recognize faces, you kind of pull the lever and the tumblers come out with a particular sort of organ, uh, a particular set of criteria. And that's the presentation that that child uh, has. And again, speaks to the tremendous variability and inter-individual variability that we see in CVI. The, the kids are very, very unique. The profile of these individuals tends to be very, very unique. It's very hard to generalize across all, all individuals. And it's important from an assessment standpoint to keep that in mind. A little bit more information about CVI in terms of the major causes. Again, probably review for many of you, but let's just kind of go through many, many causes of CVI, but the biggest one is perinatal hypoxia or some ischemic event. So in other words, essentially the baby has a stroke during development, right? The baby is, uh, is in stress, uh, maybe uh, at, at risk uh, of dying, and we go in and we save the baby and we put it, the child, for example, in neonatal, intensive neonatal care and we save the baby. But there are many, many other causes to keep in mind as well. It could be trauma, it could be maternal health issues, it could be infection, it could be genetic and metabolic disorders as well. But again, the big one is some sort of hypoxic or ischemic event, right? This is again very, very important because we know that hypoxic damage or, 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 uh, or ischemic damage to the brain causes extensive damage throughout, not only in terms of white matter, as I mentioned, the connections between the cortex and the thalamus, but to the cortex itself and also to the thalamus also. So you may ask, why do I use the term cerebral visual impairment? The main reason is, is because we know that there's damage that is quite extensive throughout the brain. It's not just the cortex that's damaged. We know that white matter is damaged extensively. We know the deep structures of the brain are damaged as well. So I particularly use the term cerebral to get at this idea that the damage reflects all the levels of the brain as well, not just the cortex. It's also useful to separate children in the case of hypoxic or ischemic damage, those who are born premature versus those who are born term. And those individuals who are born premature, that's to say less than 37 weeks, often you have this presentation where you see these very, very large ventricles, right? So the, electro, the ventricles enlarge, this is a condition called periventricular leukomalacia or PVL, where blood rushes into the ventricles. And as the blood is resorbed back over time, those ventricles enlarge right, in size, right? And around the ventricles, of course, are these white matter connections that are damaged in terms of development, right? And we call this hypomyelination, meaning lowered myelination or impaired myelination. And of course, these are the pathways that connect to the visual brain and other parts of the brain. So once these pathways are damaged, that's when we anticipate there's going to be processing issues, depending again, where they are in the brain. If they're in the back of the brain, they're of course, related to vision. In the case of children who are born term, slightly different presentation, we refer to this as hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, or HIE, slightly different presentation because the brain is a little bit farther along in terms of its development, but areas of the brain, what we call watershed areas, in other words, parts of the brain that are far away from where the arteries and the veins run are typically very, very susceptible to any type of, um, of, of reduction in oxygenation and blood flow and has a slightly different presentation, but we know that there is still also very diffuse white matter injury. So again, just keep in mind that in the case of hypoxic and ischemic damage, white matter injury is very, very common in these individuals. Again, white matter being the connections in between the brain. So in terms of our research, we have two primary areas that we're interested in. 
The first is coming up with novel methods of characterizing brain anatomy and function and CVI. So obviously, as I mentioned, if you just look at the level of the eye, you're not going to get a good indication of what exactly is happening at the level of the brain, right? When you look inside the eye, you see the retina, and that's certainly very, very important. I don't want to downplay that. But Again, we know that the eye itself doesn't explain all the visual issues that that individual is having. So in order to understand what's going on, we have to go deeper into the brain and come up with other ways to understand what the brain is doing or how the brain, I should say, is damaged. And even as I mentioned, structural MRIs or, or basic structural MRIs or standard, I should say, structural MRIs don't always show us damage in the case of CVI. So what we're interested in is looking at the wiring of the brain, these white matter connections to give us a better indication in terms of where the damage is and how that damage could be related to the visual problems that the individual has. The second arena that we're interested in is looking at novel methods at assessing visual function, or more specifically what's referred to as functional vision. And I'll spend some time on this point as well. Right? So going beyond visual acuity, many of you know that many of these children with CVI go and see their eye doctor. They, maybe they read the visual acuity chart and they do quite well. Maybe they have no visual deficit, but they're all complaining about these higher order processing problems, right? So they're clearly visually impaired, but not to the standard criteria of say acuity of visual field. How do we capture that? How do we go beyond excuse me, measurements of visual acuity and visual field to get a better understanding of these visual processing deficits in these children. And I'm gonna show you some of these novel approaches using eye tracking and visual search to get at that. So the first point that I mentioned about uh, structural imaging, I wanna illustrate this problem in terms of why structural MRIs don't tell the entire story. It's not to say that they're not useful. It's not to say they're not important, it doesn't give us the entire story in terms of what's going on. So what I'm showing you here is three MRIs uh, pictures. These are axial cuts, so they're cutting flat across the brain like this. Dr. Maribet moves his hand horizontally back and forth from the back of his head near the top of the ear to the front of his head near the eye. This is an individual, a sighted control with neurotypical development with 20-20 vision. This is an individual who is oc with ocular blindness, profound ocular blindness, light perception. And if you notice, they look very, very similar, right? The third example that I'm showing you, this is an individual with CVI. And you can see these enlarged ventricles that I mentioned, these very, very large ventricles associated with periventricular leukomalacia, or PVL, and also changes at the back of the visual cortex of how the brain is folding and its overall development. This person, nonetheless, has 20-20 visual acuity. So herein lies the problem, the mismatch that I was trying to illustrate. How is it that the person who structurally has the most, quote, normal looking brain is profoundly blind, but the individual who clearly has dramatic structural changes at the level of the brain has 20-20 visual acuity, the same as sighted control. And that's the important point to think about. And we call this the neuroradiological paradox or the neuroradiology paradox. That is to say that lesion load, the extent of apparent damage that we see on a structural MRI doesn't always correlate with clinical symptoms. And that's very, very important. So even if we see damage, it doesn't necessarily allow us to predict the type of visual deficits that individual will have. And that's an important issue that we need to think about. So given that limitation in mind, we are now trying to think of another way at using neuroimaging to help us better understand how the brain is put together, how the brain is wired. And we suspect that CVI is really fundamentally a disorder of brain connectivity. In other words, how the brain is wired how it communicates, right? And we think that the underlying connectivity is associated with observed visual dysfunctions or impairments. So we're not necessarily interested in the general structure of the brain. We're really more concerned or interested in terms of the wiring of the brain. So how do we do that? We use a technique called HARDI or diffusion-based imaging and HARDI stands for high angular resolution diffusion imaging. Basically what this technique does is that it follows the movement of water inside the brain. And if that motion of water in three-dimensional space is going along a particular plane, we hypothesize that that motion is in line with how a brain, uh, uh, or I should say how a nerve cell is oriented, right? Along the axon 
of that nerve cell. So for example, if it's going along this, if the water molecule is moving along this way, it means that it's oriented with a nerve cell in that same direction. If that water molecule is moving completely randomly, it's probably in a part of the brain where it isn't necessarily associated with a white matter tract, like the ventricles, for example. So that's kind of the rationale behind it. What I'm showing you here is a comparison on the left of an individual who's a control and an individual on the right with CVI. And you're gonna see the brains rotate. First, you're gonna see the cortex, the gray matter of the brain, and then you're going to see the underlying white matter connections and how this looks like. So you see the two brains spinning here, control on the left, CVI on the right. These are the white matter connections that the technology gives us. And then what we do is a virtual dissection. We ask the computer software or the algorithm to show us the connections of the back of the brain, the occipital visual cortex, to the rest of the brain. And what you should see here is two main pathways. This pathway here from the back of the brain, the occipital cortex, to the parietal cortex, to the front, is referred to as the superior longitudinal fasciculus, the SLF. This is the dorsal processing stream. There is another pathway as well from the occipital cortex all the way down the temporal cortex. This is referred to as the inferior longitudinal fasciculus. This refers to as the ventral processing stream. So we now have a technique that allows us to look specifically at the two main visual processing pathways of the brain. This isn't a control, of course. Here it is, the same approach in a CVI individual. And what you should notice right away is that the ventral stream is actually in pretty good shape all things considered. But the dorsal stream from the occipital cortex to parietal cortex to frontal cortex really does not seem to have the same degree of development as the ventral stream does. And this again fits with this idea of dorsal stream dysfunction or dorsal stream impairment. It seems that the dorsal processing stream has much more impairment in terms of development than the ventral stream. That's not to say there aren't ventral stream impairments. But from a comparison standpoint, it seems that the dorsal stream is really, really impaired. And I'll show you some more data to kind of drive this point home. Here's a sagittal, again, reconstruction showing you the two pathways in question. This is in a 17-year-old sighted control. Again, you see the dorsal pathway, the SLF. You see the ventral pathway, the ILF, so the two processing streams. Really, really nice development and really, really nice arborization of the two pathways. Here it is in an ocular blind individual. All right, This is a person with Leber's congenital amaurosis. And what do you notice? The pathways are, again, very, very well developed, both the dorsal and the ventral, right? Challenge you to tell me who is the individual born profoundly blind and who's the person with neurotypical development in this case, right? So in ocular blindness, the two pathways are largely intact or appear to be largely intact. Here's it is an example of a CVI individual with PVL, in other words, born premature. And again, as I showed you, ventral stream seems to be developed a little, maybe not as robust in the case of our control, but the dorsal stream really seems to be impaired in overall in terms of its development. Here's an example of another CVI uh, example, but this is a person born term. So this is a person who doesn't have PVL and you see a very, very similar uh, presentation. Again, ventral stream looks like it's in good shape, but the dorsal stream, again, doesn't seem to be well developed in this case. And again, this is not just a, uh, an issue of prematurity in these large ventricles. Even in the case of a child who's born term, we still see this dorsal pathway impairment in terms of overall, overall development as well. We can also mathematically look at the overall connectivity of the brain as well, how the pieces actually come together. What you're showing here, or what I'm showing you here is something called whole brain network analysis. And I'll explain to you what this means. So you're looking at the top of the brain here over all the control individuals. This is about 15, 15 individuals averaged together. So it's not just one person. It's a, it's a compilation of many individuals. You're looking at the top of the brain and each one of these blue dots represents a particular part of the brain, right? So parietal cortex, occipital cortex, temporal cortex, frontal cortex. It's a node, a particular part of the brain. The lines in between correspond to the strength of the connections in between those areas. So red means very, very strong connection, relatively speaking. Yellow and green in the middle, blue means relatively weak connection. So what this tells us is that in our sighted controls, we see very, very strong overall connection in the brain. 
How is it in the case of ocular blindness? Again, congenital ocular blindness. Again, very, very strong overall connections, right? Very, very similar looking to the case of our sighted controls. In fact, if you subtract these two, uh, um, these two analyses together, if you take this brain and you subtract it from that brain, what we find is that there's extra connections in the case of ocular blindness that don't exist in the case of, uh, of, of our sighted controls. So, brain, so connections from the occipital cortex to language areas, to memory areas, these extra connections in the case of ocular blindness that may be, again, related to these compensatory behaviors that I mentioned at the beginning of this section. So the wiring of the brain in the case of ocular blindness is such that may support indeed these compensatory behaviors, right? How is it in the case of CVI? It's an under-connected brain. So overall, you can see that the strength of the connections throughout the brain, not just in the visual areas, but throughout the brain overall are much, much weaker, right? So that's the big fundamental take home possession in this particular case. Why are individuals with ocular blindness so different than individuals with CVI, even though they may have the same measured visual acuity, it's because their visual, their, their, their connectivities fundamentally are different. The way that the brain is wired in the case of ocular blindness is fundamentally different than the case of CVI. Even in the case of an individual who has high visual acuity, we see the same overall reduction in connectivity as well. So that's an important thing to think about. That's why we think these two populations are so different and respond differently to education strategies and habilitation strategies as well. They're wired differently. Okay, so a summary of, uh, of these overall findings. It's not just the connectivity, as I said, that we see that's different. We also notice that in the case of CVI, the thalamus seems to be smaller. There's a reduced overall volume of the thalamus, particularly these visual nuclei that I mentioned, like the LGN. So at the thalamic subcortical level, we see reductions and 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 a few. Uh, I want to say a less degree, but but overall the development is not as robust of these of these subcortical structures. We also see reduced gray matter volume as well. So in particular in these occipital areas, we see in CVI that the volume of the cortex also seems to be reduced, particular in the back of the brain, the visual cortex. And again, I showed you. Uh, using this technique of diffusion-based imaging that the white matter pathways as well are also reduced. So again, back to my point of why I use the term cerebral visual, uh, visual impairment is because it implements structural changes throughout the entire brain, not just in the case of the thalamus, not just in the case of the cortex, but also the connections as well, white matter connections. So when we speak of CVI from a structural standpoint, it is impacting throughout the brain as well, cortically, subcortically, as well as white matter connections. All right, last part of the, of the presentation, we're gonna talk now about functional assessment. So that was sort of the brain anatomy piece. We now want to get to trying to assess visual function beyond visual acuity and so on. Now, if you work with children, and of course all of you do, uh, in the lab, I promise you they behave exactly the same way. If you're gonna ask them to, to look at letters on a chart or dots or anything along those lines, they really don't like it. They, really, they just don't find this particularly interesting as you might imagine. And this of course might be one thing you wanna do obviously in an eye exam, but if you wanna study the quote, their behavior and their, and their issues in the real world, it's a big departure staring at letters, right? Letters is not what the visual world looks like. And this brings up an important point, what I refer to as visual function. Visual function are assessments of a particular aspect of vision. It could be acuity, it could be perimetry, for example. And even, for example, if you use more, let's say, elaborate visual stimuli, at the end of the day, these techniques don't have what's called good ecological validity. In other words, they're very far from what the real world looks like. They have excellent stimulus control, right? I know everything there is about these particular stimuli, the contrast, the size of the targets, how many targets, et cetera, et cetera. But the world doesn't look like this. If you're a child, the world looks more like this. This is what you're interested in, right? This is what the world looks like. The problem is, is I don't have very good stimulus control, right? If I want to see whether or not this child has a particular difficulty finding their favorite toy, it could be for a variety of reasons. How many toys are there, the lighting, it could be how big the box is, et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot of parameters that could be influencing their, uh, their decision-making or their impairment, I should say. 
What we think is there has to be a middle ground between visual function, the ability to assess a particular aspect of vision and functional vision, how you use your vision in the real world. And we think that middle ground is virtual reality because virtual reality will A, give us that stimulus control that we're looking for because we design the tasks, but we can also design tasks that are much more naturalistic, much more appropriate and tasks that seem to impl or are more or closer, I should say, to the real world. So we think it's a good middle ground. And this is exactly what we've been doing and combining these virtual reality based tasks with eye tracking or visual search tasks, I should say. So the first one that we did was called a virtual toy box. And this was based on a focus group study that we did with parents, uh, individuals with CVI, uh, uh, fellow teachers and, uh, and clinicians to come up with tasks that we thought would be really helpful in helping us understand the type of visual deficits that they have. So young children, for example, will tell us they have a hard time finding their favorite toy, for example. So we did something called the virtual toy box. So this looks like a toy box that you're looking down from a top, top view. And the idea is that you have to pick a toy that you wanna work with, right? So it could be a blue truck, an orange basketball, a yellow duck. So the child has to pick the toy they wanna work with. And this is important, not only from a motivational standpoint, but also to make Make sure that the child recognizes the toy in isolation by itself. Then we put the toy in a five by five matrix. So in this particular case, the toy is, is the blue truck. It's a five by five matrix. And what you notice is we change the number of distractor toys in the matrix. So low, medium, and high distractors means that we change the number of toys that are different, right? So our suspicion is that as we increase the number of distractors in the five by five matrix, it's going to be harder and harder to find the target toy. We also add other conditions. We add what's called a color match. A color match is a second toy that's the same color, but a different shape. Because we want to know, is the child using the actual shape to identify it? Or is it using another cue, for example, the same color to identify the target as well? So this is kind of a, what's kind of a catch trial, if you will, to see if, if another toy of the same color somehow impairs their performance or distracts their performance. And then we have sort of this background clutter scenario where we increase, put all this sort of clutter in the background to see does this make the task even harder when you really, really make uh, the visual clutter and crowding of the visual scene really, really at a high level. And this is what the, the results look like. So I'm showing you an eye tracking recording here. On the left is a control with neurotypical development. On the right is an individual with CVI. The task is again to look for this particular blue truck. You'll see this yellow blob moving on the screen and that yellow blob is where the eyes are at any given time. It's important to note that when they do the task, they don't see this yellow blob. I'm just doing this for the purposes of the recording. Right. So just to show you where they are. So this is a head to head comparison. And let's take a look at what it looks like. OK, so what you notice right away is that in the control individual. They get straight to the target, but the CVI individual takes a much more long and, and complicated path. Here is the, the color match. Do you see how they go back and forth before they decide that it's the blue truck? And here's the situation with clutter. In this particular case, they get there. And it's the second example. You see that they miss it completely. Right. So a nice example showing you that, yes, they can find the target, but the path that they get there is much more complicated and much longer. And we think this fits with the typical presentation that we see with a lot of CVI individuals with CVI. They tell us after school, they're exhausted. And we think a lot of it has to do with the fact is that they're working harder to do exactly the same task. They get there. They find the target, but it's it's not as as crisp. It's not as direct. And again, going back to my original comment, good visual performance is not just about knowing where to look. It's also about knowing where not to look, right? And I think this, again, gives a nice example of how the path is much more circuitous, much more difficult uh, for the case of CVI than it is our case of controls. You might also think that, well, maybe the reason why this child is having such a hard time is they may have some underlying deficit about their eye movements, and that actually isn't the case. What I'm showing you here again is a control recording, again, control on the left, CVI on the right. And what you notice here is that when the toy is by itself, both the control and CVI get to it right away, right? There isn't this long, long path to get to it anymore. In fact, again, 
can you distinguish between the CVI and control individuals? They look identical, right? So it's not the task itself of trying to find the blue truck in, or the target in isolation. It's the complexity of the visual world and the environment that makes the task harder to do. Again, something that you would not get in a standard eye exam. You would have to find a scenario like this to show that indeed there is a visual impairment related to that search. We have data with this. We have a large, a fairly large sample of individuals. We have about, I think, eight or nine CVI, no, excuse me, over 10 now CVI individuals who have participated in this task. In this graphic, what I'm showing here is the effect of task demand, so low, medium, and higher. As you move across this axis, or excuse me, this, this axis, the task gets harder. And on the y-axis is their performance. And the important, thing, the important thing to remember here is the higher you are, the worse you're doing on the task. And here is the performance in our controls, right? The blue line that you see here. So on low task demands, medium task demands, and high task demands, you see that there's a slight uptick between medium and high. But overall, our controls are pretty stable in terms of their performance. So as the task gets harder, for the most part, they're performing pretty much at the same level. Here it is in our CVI individuals. First of all, at the low task level, you notice that they're already performing worse. And as the task gets harder, you have this steep rise in this curve. And we think that this steep rise in this curve corresponds to the sensitivity of task demands. As the task gets harder, as there's more and more different distractors, as we make the task harder, their performance Go, uh, it gets worse and worse. So they're extremely sensitive to increasing task demands. Interestingly, we have a subgroup of CVI individuals who have very, very high visual acuity, 2020, 2025 visual acuity, and their performance is the same. You'll see that their line here essentially overlaps with the other CVI group. So high visual acuity doesn't get you out of this. This is not just a visual acuity issue, I should say, or it cannot be explained, I should say, by visual acuity impairment. It's really a processing issue. It's a higher order spatial processing issue, not just an issue of visual acuity. We have now coupled this, um, this uh, task with EEG recordings or electroencephalography. Electroencephalography allows us to record brain activity at the level of uh, that's correlated or associated with this particular task. So here you see the device that we're using. In fact, this is me. This is why I can show this picture. So here you can see I'm sitting in front of the monitor. The eye tracker is down here on the bottom. And we have this wireless recording technique. These are 20 electrodes on my head. And you'll notice that it's attached to this little yellow box. Box. This yellow box is actually a wireless Bluetooth uh, tra transceiver. So it's quite nice. They're not tethered to the machine. They can actually, if they want to get up and go to the bathroom or take a break, we don't have to start all over again. So it's a system that records wirelessly. The other thing that's nice is that this has accelerometers in there. So as the child moves their head, we can, we can record that and use that to clean up the signal. So even if, if the child tends to move their head as well, we can use it as a way to filter out uh, the signal also. What I'm showing you here is activity in the back of the brain recorded by the EEG technique. This is in a control individual. So this is at the onset of the toy box. And this is before the eyes move. This is up to 400 milliseconds. Typically the eyes move at about 700 or 1000 milliseconds after we present the toy box. So this is that initial capture, if you will, of the toy box. And what do you notice in our controls? That as the toy box comes on board, we see this really, really nice robust activation in the occipital pole, parietal cortex, and also temporal cortex. And here it is in our CVI individual. First thing you'll notice is that the, the, there is this blue sort of deactivation or desynchronization, I should say, along the parietal frontal cortex or the dorsal stream. Temporal cortex seems to be doing well. In other words, identifying the objects, and indeed they can identify the object, but where it is seems to be impaired as the data would suggest. So the electrophysiology is suggesting dorsal stream impairment. The white matter connectivity is suggesting dorsal stream impairment. And indeed the behavior is telling us that it's largely a spatial problem, not a recognition problem. So the pieces are, are slowly coming together. 
Uh, you might be asking, well, can you go beyond uh, just simple, uh, you know, testing with this? And we are now looking at the visual, or I should say the virtual reality use of this Toy Boss test and other scenarios. We're thinking now, working with various teachers, how can we use the Toy Box to figure out particular cues that might be salient for the individual? You can imagine performance as a function of moving the target and seeing does that enhance their performance. If we change the color of the target, does that enhance their performance? And the final example I'll show you, if we increase the luminance, does that change the performance? And obviously, if we remove the clutter, does that also improve their performance as well? So the nice thing about virtual reality is that it's not just a question of assessing and seeing what challenges excuse me, they have, but it's also an opportunity to kind of run simulations and see what particular aspects of a visual scene make their performance particularly challenging or perhaps can enhance their performance as well. And I'll show you a second example where we, we've done that also. We have a second task, a virtual reality task called the, the virtual hallway or the virtual corridor, which is more for our adolescents. And in this particular case, instead of looking for a toy in a toy box, they have to find a principal of a fictitious high school. So what you're seeing here, instead of finding toys, you'll find that there's an individual that they'll have to locate amongst other individuals who are walking. And here, what we do is we increase the number of individuals in the crowd. So the more people in the crowd, the harder it should be for our individuals to find the target. So again, a head-to-head -head comparison. On the left is a control. On the right is an individual with CVI. And again, the yellow blob is where they're looking and tracking at a particular time. So let's see that. Here's the low distractor condition. You'll see that the control and the CVI individual are both doing well. They lock onto the principal. So they lock on and they're able to track with time. I'll give you another example. This is the catch trial. This is a person who has the same facial features, but is a different person. You saw the CVI individual went back and forth. Here's the high distractor level. You'll see the control locks on, CVI is delayed. So a much more demanding task because not only is there a lot, are we changing the number of distractors, we're now adding the element of motion in this particular task as well. And very similar to what we saw in the toy box, as you might imagine, we again in our control, so this is performance as a function of task demands. What we're finding in our controls is there's a slight uptick, right? They get a slightly worse as the task gets harder, but a much, much more dramatic increase in our controls, this, excuse me, in our CVI individuals, even in those individuals with CVI with high visual acuity. So again, they are extremely sensitive to increasing task demands. The more that's going on, the harder it is for them to carry out the task. This is true, not just in the toy box with static objects. It's also true in the case of our, uh, of our, uh, of our hallway where objects are moving as well. I want to give you an example of one individual that we worked with, where again, we think that this can be helpful beyond just simple, uh, you know, diagnosing or simple assessments, I should say, of function. So one thing that we did is we said, what was particularly challenging for this child? So we asked him to do the child, and here's the performance and controls in blue, right? And here's the performance of the individual on the task. So controls in blue, again, this relatively flat association, our CVI individual, in red, again, they're, they're, they show this relationship of impaired performance with increasing task demands. Then we did the, exactly the same task with them moving through the environment. So not only were the individuals moving in the corridor, but they were moving themselves through the corridor. And what we found is that this actually made their performance worse. So moving through the environment and doing exactly the same thing made the task even harder. So this was one cue that we did for this particular young man to say, you know, if you need to find your classroom or a particular landmark, you need to stop and assess the visual uh, scene in front of you to kind of get your bearings, to get an understanding where you are and then proceed. Because we know that moving through the environment actually makes the task even harder. A second thing we decided to do was to try to increase the saliency of the target. And you may think that this is a strange, a strange solution, but we thought it was quite interesting that if we put the target wearing a very bright yellow jacket, so in this case, the principal is wearing a bright yellow jacket and replicate the task, what we found is we essentially normalized his performance. So in other words, creating a high saliency target really dramatically improved his performance for this young gentleman which of course is quite dramatic. And I'll show you an example. So this is the same individual with and without this yellow jacket strategy. So you can see here with, they find the principal, 
and can track it without they missed it completely. I'll show you another example here. You can see they lock on right away back to it and can track here without it, they can't find it. So the use of a high saliency target or a high saliency uh, cue is very, very helpful for this particular individual, which again was something that the family was able to take and use. Now, I'm not suggesting that they should call their school and say that the principal wear a yellow jacket, but it really gives you a sense that there are some cues that might be particularly helpful for an individual. In fact, I'll tell you a quick story. And we're, we're very, very close to the families that we work with. And this mother gave me, um, uh, told me a story or sent me a text how they were going to this particular uh, amusement park uh, near their home where there are a lot of, a lot of people and, and their son of course was very, very anxious of going to a place where there's a lot of crowds and so on. So the mother had a very, very clever idea of all of them wearing these bright orange t-shirts so that their son at any given time could look back and find his brothers, his parents at any given time. And this lowered his stress level tremendously. The fact that at any given time he could locate his family, for example, really allowed him to enjoy his day and also for the family as well. So just to give you an example of how using these virtual reality scenarios can help you probe, figure out if there are particular cues that might be particularly helpful for that particular individual and that could eventually could translate into the real world. Last couple of examples I'm, uh, I'm going to share with you. We're also very interested in trying to understand in the case of CVI, contract, uh, concrete versus abstract concepts. And what do I mean by that? So for example, if I show you this object here of an actual banana, this photo of a banana, you have no problem recognizing it. This is a cartoon picture of a, of a banana. Here is a character, caricature, I should say, of a banana. And here is something that is the same color and shape of a banana, but is not a banana, right? But you have no problem distinguishing between these four objects. Why? Because your visual repertoire is very, very robust and you're able to easily distinguish between them. What we're finding with a lot of the individuals that we work with, with CVI, is they have a hard time extrapolating beyond realistic photos. So it's a challenge for them to see these sort of abstract pictures and so on and make sense of these abstract pictures. So with a colleague named Matt Tijan, who you're probably all familiar with, we're trying to come up with a more systematic approach to study this, right? So the idea is to use these color photos and then break them down into various uh, various options. So there could be a color representation that's realistic. There could be a non-colored representation. And there could be an abstract representation of that same target. And we jumble these all around and we ask the child to recognize them, right? To identify, I should say, the target. And what we're finding is that our controls are able to, again, recognize across the board, but our individuals with CVI have a much harder time the more and more abstract the targets are. And I'll give you just an anecdotal example that Matt shared with me that I thought was actually quite interesting. So here's one of the targets that he showed. And this particular view, it's a caricature of an elephant or an abstract drawing, I should say, of an elephant. We go through the task and the young man is going through it. And when we ask him, what do you see? He says, it's a remote. We say, okay, that's fine. We continue through the task. And then after the task, we go back and we ask the individual, can you explain why you chose that particular, you know, why did you say remote for this particular particular object, right? In other words, he doesn't see the elephant, he sees it as a remote. And it's actually quite interesting because I don't know if any of you have a PlayStation at home. This is what a PlayStation remote looks like. So you can see kind of the parallel with that, right? The ears are kind of like the handles. These are the two eyes, right? So this is a young man whose visual repertoire, obviously, as I mentioned, is highly influenced by his prior visual experiences. So when you show him an abstract image, he is going to fit it with something that he's previously seen or very familiar with, right? In this particular case, it's, it's a remote that he plays with almost every day. So a nice example of showing you of the visual world that you perceive is very, very much driven by your prior visual experiences, right? We are again looking at this at a more systematic level, looking at the role of language function and semantic processing. Again, uh, interesting task that we're putting together. I'll show you very, very quickly. What we do is we flash a word on the screen, in this particular case, helicopter. And then we flash an image or we show, I should say, a visual scene, and the individual has to search the visual scene and find the target that's presented, 
on the screen before. So for, for the helicopter, they have to go through and look the visual, search the visual scene and find the target. So they have to read the word, put a mental picture in their mind of what that target looks like, and then find it in the realistic visual scene. When you do this in a control individual, and the green dots show you where they were looking. And what do you notice? They go to the teddy bear, they go to the airplane, they go to the train, and then they go to the helicopter. Objects that are semantically similar, they're all toys, right? These are all transport objects. So in other words, when we look at a visual scene, we automatically guide our search to things that we think are helpful and helping us find the target. In contrast, you do exactly the same task in a CVI individual. And again, notice how the visual search is much more random. I wouldn't say random, I should say, is much more, uh, more spread out. So it's not just the particular toys in question. They look everywhere. They look at the globe. They look up here on the shelf. They look at these bright objects that are sitting here. And then finally, get to it. So again, they get to the target, but a much, much longer path. So the question is, is can we somehow predict what's going on? Could we read their minds, so to speak, and understanding what strategies are they using to try to figure this out? And there is actually a way to mathematically do this. So it turns out that you can use computer vision to analyze a visual scene and understand what are the biggest features in there. You can use something what's called a saliency map which is a mathematical representation of what are the most salient things in the visual scene. You can also use another approach called a semantic map to say, what are the objects in the visual scene that are similar to the target you're looking for? So now obviously in this case, the helicopter is close to the airplane, the train, and the teddy bear, for example, right? They're all toys, right? So semantically, there is one prediction and saliency wise, it's another prediction. And you can mathematically score this, what's referred to as an ROC curve. And in our control, you'll see the higher value fits with the prediction of semantic processing. In other words, our control is largely driven by semantic cues. When we do exactly the same analysis in our CVI individual, we find the opposite. Their visual search is largely driven by saliency not semantics, right? And our theory is, is that the higher the verbal IQ or the higher visual fun or language function we have in the individual, the more likely it's going to approach semantic processing and less saliency driven. So it's another way of allowing us to understand what strategies are individuals with CVI using when they perceive the visual world. And for the time being, it seems that it's largely saliency based rather than semantic based. Right? So this is an ongoing study that we're doing right now. So Pam, just, just uh, watching time, I think I can wrap things up. I have a couple of just last sort of things, but just from a time standpoint, I think it would be good just to, um, to, to wrap up and, uh, and perhaps just open it up for, for conversation. Okay, that sounds great. If you have time to, to take a few questions. I am completely um, free. I just unfortunately went, I was hoping to leave you more time, but it, uh, it took more time to get through the signs, but I am completely open to, to anything. That's okay. I'm going to go ahead and throw in the chat um, the ending code if anybody needs to leave. Um, but if any, if you'd like to stay, I think Dr. Maribet would be happy to take some questions. We are going to also do a follow-up conversation with him at our Kansas CVI Think Tank meeting on April 22nd at nine o'clock. Um, so be looking for that registration and um, we will send the link. Um, we did have a couple of questions. Um, one was about the um, the student with the hemispherectomy yes. and if they have a half thalamus. Um, and we had another question about why are there more children with optic nerve hypoplasia today than in the past? Uh, and the, I'm sorry, why are there? Mm -hmm. Why are there? Excellent. Okay, so back yes. to the first question. So um, I have to say it, it's not the typical presentation that I, or I should say a presentation that I'm familiar with in the case of hemispherectomy. So as you know, the hemispherectomy is done particularly in case where a child has uncontrollable seizures. And we know that typically what happens is if a seizure starts in one hemisphere, it tends to propagate into the other hemisphere through the corpus callosum. So typically what we try to do is split the corpus callosum so that that electrical storm, if you will, doesn't enter the other hemisphere and becomes very, very paralyzing. In extreme cases, we take the actual hemisphere out, but that's less and less now. Typically now what we do is we kind of disconnect 
one hemisphere from the other. But as I said, that's done at the level of the corpus callosum. Typically, we do not separate the thalamus or remove the thalamus. So I'm a little bit surprised in this particular situation because the thalamus is so crucial, as I said, for entering information, not just visual, but other, uh, other modalities, except olfaction or a smell, I should say. Um, it's surprising that this particular individual had their half their thalamus removed. So I'm, I'm not sure if that was indeed the case, um, but if, if that was indeed the case, it's, it would say that you know half of the visual field is probably going to be impaired, obviously. Um, but if it was done very, very young, typically a lot of these children with intensive occupational and, and, and physical therapy recover uh, considerable function. Um, Marlene Berman is a, an individual from Pittsburgh who studies this uh, particular scenario extensively with children who have hemispherectomies or hemisphere separations um, and their recovery of visual function over time. And again, the timing is crucial. If it happens very, very early in development, it's, it appears that the intact hemisphere can take on a lot of functions. And there are even cases where the entire visual field gets remapped onto one hemisphere as well. So again, timing is everything, the extent of the surgery and, and how much was, was separated uh, is, a, is another factor, but the intensity of the rehabilitation strategies or rehabilitation, rehabilitation strategies early on are crucial in determining what type of function that you'll see later on. There's another question about if a person is missing their corpus callosum, but no other brain structure abnormality and no brain injury, does that alone indicate a cerebral visual impairment? So great question. Um, and individuals who have this corpus callosum split, it turns out that a lot of the cognitive and visual perceptual issues are quite subtle. And the reason why is because there are other ways for the two hemispheres to talk to one another, not just the corpus callosum. They connect, for example, through subcortical structures and other what are called commissures, other ways. And you may ask, for example, if the two hemispheres are split, how is, an able, how is a person able to walk, for example, or coordinate movement? And it has to do with sort of the redundancy of not only deep structures of the brain, but also the spinal column. So the two brains can communicate with one another through these backdoor pathways. So going back to my analogy about the building, this is a great example where the elevators may be out through the corpus callosum, but there are stairwells where the information can still get to one side or the other. In this particular case, particularly if it happens early on, the visual deficits are typically very, very subtle. And it has a lot to do with attention issues, splitting attention between the two visual fields. But that's not to say that the individual doesn't have CVI, but the, the visual deficits are going to be typically more and more subtle than if you had, for example, a frank damage uh, to early visual pathways, the optic radiations, or the occipital cortex. I was trying to look to see if anybody else had questions. There, I'm sorry, there was also the optic uh, hypoplasia question. Oh, right. Yeah. <laughs> so indeed, optic hypoplasia is, is increasing as well. And a lot of that also has to do with the relationship uh, with prematurity. Um, and, and as well, this aggressive care and this, or I should say, improved care of, of neonates. So optic hypoplasia is often related to prematurity. And the fact that, again, we're, we're saving a lot of these, uh, of these infants, uh, you know, translates to increased prevalence of this particular condition. But in this particular case, if we get the oxygenation levels right, if the care, for example, of the child to preserve retinal development, we should also see those optic hypoplasia levels go down as well. But optic hypoplasia is a nice example because it's the interface of brain and eye when you think about it. But again, if we're more, as we improve our care of prematurity, particularly in the case of um, a retinopathy of prematurity, we should see the cases of optic hypoplasia decrease as well, but not always, because again, there could be situations where the damage is deep in the brain 
and the hypoplasia occurs because of what we call this retrograde uh, um, degeneration of the optic nerve as well. So it's, it's, um, it's a challenging case because it really implicates the eye and the brain because indeed it's the interface between the two. But those numbers should change as we change our practices as well. Interesting. Does anybody else have questions? Okay, go ahead and unmute. I'm trying to check the gallery here. Uh, Pam, Pam, just a comment again. I, I I went over time and I had some comments about plasticity and so on, but I'm happy to go sure. over those last slides at our at our regroup session. If if if, uh, if people are interested, I had some comments about neuroplasticity and impact and so on. So I'm happy to bring those slides back. I mean, you have them in in your slide deck, uh, but when we regroup, uh, I'll I'll spend a few minutes at the beginning just going over those points. Is that is that all right? That sounds great. Um, however, whatever you want to do, it's up to you. Yeah, I, I just want to be respectful of your time, but I'm I'm here. However, however much time people want to spend and ask questions, I'm I'm available. Well, I don't know about anybody else, but I could listen to this all day. It's very interesting. So um, I, I see a lot of um, head nodding. So I know I I've gotten to... some chat comments. So great. I have to take your word for it because I have not seen the chat and I can only see myself and you, Pam, and my screen. So I'll, I'll, I'll take your word for it. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming today, Thank Dr. Maribet. And Thanks we're looking that. forward to having further conversation with you on the 22nd of April. Um, thanks for um, hanging in there with this a little longer, guys. I thought it was really good information, so I didn't want to stop you. Of course, of um, course. So hopefully um, everyone got what they were coming for today. Thank you again for all of your information. And um, hopefully, um, you know, we can get all of our questions answered in our next session. And um, Dr. Maribet has his um, his information. If you needed to contact him via email, he's happy at any time, I know, to answer any questions. Um, so thank you for making neuroscience easy to understand. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate it. Thank you. My, my best, best of luck to all of you. And again, I hope your families are safe and well. And, you know, is it, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's already a very, very challenging situation and now even more challenging. I wish you all the best of luck with what you're doing. Thank you so much. Please be in touch. Good luck. Bye. Image of a girl at dusk standing on the edge of a rock reaching for the stars. Displayed is the quote, not being able to see the stars does not mean you can't reach for them by Anon. KSSB logo at the bottom right.